What's up, Dev? Hi, Roger. How are you? I'm doing good. I'm I'm pretty stoked, man. There's I'm, two two Rogers on the show today. I'm I'm outnumbered two to one by Rogers. But you know what? If I if one has to be outnumbered two to one by Rogers, there are no other two Rogers that one would prefer to be outnumbered two to one by. Well, that makes me feel special. I'm sure it does. To Roger, number two as well. Actually, I'm the number two, man. That's the number you know, one right there. Normally, I would say don't put yourself down like that. But today, <laughs> I don't know, Rod. I might have to say you're Roger number two because yeah, our guest Roger today is the great Roger Steffens. Yes. Um, lecturer, author, archivist, all around great guy. I have known him for about 20 years, maybe more than 20 years now. Uh, he's a big reason why I got into reggae in the first place. Um, and so, you know, we want to hurry up and get Roger on. And so we are going to move right to our first segment of the show, which is our record of the week. And I don't remember who's going first today. Um, oh, I don't mind jumping in. Should I jump in? Why don't you go first? I'll go first. So this record is a really cool record. It's not necessarily one that I would play when I'm out there DJing, but I just love showing it to all my musician friends and all my, you know, reggae nerd friends. It's called All Combined by the Upsetters. Ooh. Listen to the tune and, and pay attention to the melodies, and we'll talk about it after it. Listen.
Ooh. I'll, I'll combine. I love that intro. So, so let's good. start off with the intro. When I first got this record, I was so stoked about it because of the intro. They they come in right with like a funk drop beat, right? So it's, it's right. like doom, 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 doom. Piano, you know, kind of hits octaves or starts building up the chord and then immediately kicks into some reggae groove. Now, when I first heard it, I was like, man, these guys are on point. Like, how did they nail that? And then years and years of after hearing that, I'm like, wait a minute. It sounds spliced. Like, it yeah. sounds like the tape is totally spliced, you know? That's like, a splice. It's a splice for sure. So and I gave that's him- something Lee Perry would do at that time. Like, you know, uh, Cow Thief Skank, that, that's one of the, like, classic examples from that era where he splices right. different different rhythms totally. on one tape. That's totally what that is. That's totally what that is, right? And I was like, geez, man, that sounds... That's why Analog is Forgiving. You can do that with tape. It just it just it marries each other well, the two pieces. Right. So um, the instrumental medley, that's what this is. Ladies and gentlemen, I encourage you to go back and listen because there are many songs within this song. And uh, if you if you heard uh, one of the songs, please, in the comment section, uh, r- you know, jot down one of the tunes you heard. I heard Blood and Fire. I heard... Uh, Hints of Fat Man from Derek Morgan, which, by the way, we were going to have him on the podcast in a couple weeks. Um, and then there's other melodies that I've heard. I heard Holy Holy, which yes. is um, like Larry McDonald Cl- last Clancy week. Eccles, right? About, about, he, he played on that tune. I heard that in there. Right, on Clan Disc. Mm-hmm. Um, and then there's, there's some melodies that I, you know, it's one of those things where you listen and you're like, I know that. Well, what song is that? You know, and then you, tr- you keep trying to hum it and, and hope the song that pops in your head. But... Yes, it's just a total party in there, man. Yeah. As a musician, I kind of feel for them because as I hear that, I get like, it's it's fun, right? You, you're almost all on a race together, and it's like, I'll see you at the end. Like, it's, <laughs> it's, it's no verse, chorus, verse, chorus anymore. Right. Now it's like, all right, we're going to get done with that. We're going to get done with that. It's like a straight up just epic little baby opera right there, reggae opera. So... Um, yeah, that's a, that's one of the tunes that, like I said, it's not necessarily a banger that you would put on in in, in the clubs, but it's so, I have so much respect for the upsetters and everyone in there because you know it, they do it justice. All, all every single piece of that puzzle is uh, good in its own right. And, Although I bet you there was a time when that was able to be played somewhere live. I mean, especially that bullet seven, that, the, the the bullet copy you have. You know, that's mm-hmm. a UK pressing true and i just i bet you when that came out in the uk it was it was most definitely and that's a great point because yes i think that it's it was a different time so you had different rules quote unquote back then right compared to now what i find is you know you're a dj i'm a dj and when we spin you get a lot of reaction whenever you're going to spin something off the Mm-hmm. the Trojan box sets or something, the top 100 tunes, right? Because people like to hear what they know. Whereas back then, it was a different mindset. Um, it's more of discovering things that they haven't heard. And that's kind of the mindset I have, right? If I go out and listen to a DJ, I'm going to be in awe if they play like an organ instrumental reggae tune that I've never heard right. before. Like, that's what I want to hear. I like the combination, you know, like that Boss Harmony here in LA from the Dub Club. That's why Great he's DJ, one of my yeah. favorite DJs because he he does such a good job of like playing the songs people know, but then interspersing it with songs that are equally as great, but are lesser known. You know what I mean? And, right. the, and the crowd's more forgiving because they know like they're, they're feeling so good off of just hearing that one tune that they love and they're about to get some more tunes that they love. And now he sneaks in, you know, some totally. obscure banger that's, you know, that should be huge. Right. So, right. Yeah. It's great. Well then, man, there's my, there's my tune record of the week. Devin, what do you got for us? Okay. Well today in honor of our guest, uh, Roger Steffens, I wanted to play, um, this is a tune that I first discovered at Roger's house, uh, maybe, you know, 15, 20 years ago from uh, one of his tape cabinets. It was, um, a tape that I think he told him, I can ask him about it when we bring him, when we bring him on, but I think he told me someone had made him this tape and it had a section where it had tunes from two of the great rock steady groups, the overtakers and the rulers. Mm. And, um, this song by the rulers just, I mean, everyone will hear why it stands out. There's so many reasons, but what I want everyone to listen to primarily on this song is it's a great example within a song of, uh, the similarities between like we you know we all hear that jamaican music and ska came from like american 
you know, shuffle that do, 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 do. But this is a great example in one song of how those two, how that shuffle beat and then Rocksteady are similar because of, you know, the off beats, but then, you know, the vast difference too, because the tune, like kind of like the one you just played, starts off one way, but stick with it because it turns into a whole other thing. So here we go. This is the rulers wrong and boyo. And Billy, too bad gambling. Stackley drove seven billies for that. He drove eight. Breaks! Wrong and boy, you start all over again, huh? Why do you try to cheat? Such a small, small game Don't you know it was wrong To cheat the trying men Don't you know it was wrong To cheat the trying men Don't you know it was wrong To cheat the trying men Don't you know it was wrong To cheat the trying men Someday you're gonna fall Someday Try to trample people under your feet You better stop It is a wrong emboya Yes, man. It's insane. It's insane, huh? I love that one because of that beginning, the way they stop it and bring it back in. And you can, like I said, you know, you can really hear just in real time. Okay, like the shuffle thing. Yes, there's upbeats happening, but when it switches to rock steady, it's like that is just. It's just there's no other music like that, you know. And you know, it's just I love it. I love it that on one disc there's like just an example of that yeah. that was like the equivalent to now i mean it was so pimp right when it drops in if you're a lover of jamaican music you know that feeling that just ooh, right like for me that's the equivalent <laughs> to what the kids are listening to nowadays like when when whatever when the the pick any hip-hop song but when it drops or like a, i don't know like a dubstep tune in the club when it right. drops that's our equivalent, man. When it went into that that uh, rock steady beat, it was funny too because you could hear he was teasing the drum. Drummy was mm -hmm. teasing it, like when they were doing the boogie woogie stuff. He just, you know, Kah! it's like you know that that. 
You know it. Yeah. You've heard it on so many records. You know that rim shot. That I've that wow, I've never heard a tune that does that. Never. Have you heard that tune before? Never, ever heard that Man, tune. Man, so that tune's been covered. Like I think the Clash covered it. No kidding. And it, it, yeah, it had like it, it got some life and someone else covered it too. I was researching it because it's hard. We'll ask Roger Stephens about this in a second, but it's hard to find out things about the rulers. I've I've been on like right. all the forums and asked people and not, people don't know much about the rulers. Wow. Um, at least people that I know don't know much about them, but they had a handful of, of singles um, that came out on the Sir JJ's label. And like I said, at Roger's house years ago, he, he, I think maybe I had asked him, you know, told him I was interested in rock steady and he was like, Oh, there's listen to this tape. And it had, you know, a bunch of songs from the overtakers who you and I have talked about before with yes. Leo Graham yes. and, um, and then all these rulers tunes and all the rulers tunes are great. But that one, just, you know, just because of that intro, just really always stood out to me as great, just like great tune, man. And, you know, and it also highlights the Jamaican interest in American country music, I guess, for lack of a better term, because those Stagalee lyrics that they're singing about, that storyline mm -hmm. is an old like is an old, you know, uh, story that exists in American folk music of Stagalee um, cheating at a card game and there being some kind of duel. And you hear lots of like from like the Woody Guthrie era and, you know, those times you hear lots of like Stagga Lee songs. Right. So to find it, make its way, just to see it making its way into Jamaican music is, is super cool. Wow. Yeah. I need to get that record. That's a, that's a dope one for sure, man. Yeah. There's um, a lot of, there's a UK pressing of it that a lot of people have that's on the Rio label. But okay. um, yeah, this one I have is the Jamaican pressing on the uh, JJ's. And I just love these JJ's. Like every time I see that label that, you know, like take a chance on it. A lot of right. Ethiopian stuff on JJ's. Yeah. Um, stuff from I, that era. It was Killer. so funny. I got a J. Exactly. When you see the label, you take a chance on it, you get right. it. Um, and there was one time, quick, quick, quick story is I got, you know, got it, got a, a record off JJ label, and it was totally not reggae. But it was great because at the time I was collecting deep funk. And the band was the Mohawks, which if anybody knows yeah, about yeah. the Mohawks, they're you know, a reggae band that was on a lot of uh, on the Palma label. Uh, they have the hit called The Champ. But the song was called Pepsi, and it was just a crazy nice organ funk tune. So I was like, "Yeah, you can literally never go wrong." <laughs> like the <laughs> yeah. tastemakers, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're always gonna definitely. get a winner, most definitely, man. Well, speaking of tastemakers, yes, sir. our guest today um, is how to introduce Roger Steffens. He's, um, you know, he's traveled the world uh, lecturing on Bob Marley. Um, he's, he's an author. He's done so many things. Uh, to me, I, I've just always known him as um, just this great, this great guy in, in in Echo Park who has an amazing reggae archive and is so generous about letting people come and look at his artifacts and listen to his music. And we used to go over there and make tapes all the time. Ben Malament and myself, um, you know. So just a lot of the a lot of the reason that I'm into reggae in the first place is because of Roger Steffens. And without further ado, let's bring him on, Mr. Roger Steffens. Yes, Roger. Hey, Roger. Greetings, my brothers. It's been a lot of fun listening to that. And guess what? Huh. I yes. just reached up into the top of my listening stack to a tape that I played two days ago. And guess what it is? That's it. Wow. That is the one. Copacetic and, yeah. Rulers and overtakers. Wow. That is the one. That's the tape. That's it right there. And it's I even remember that the if you show that again, Raj, the bottom right there is like the where the where the rulers and overtakers are. I remember that whole visual. I, wow. Yeah. Wow. That's so cool. And it's a great song, isn't it? It's great. Great <laughs> tune. Wow. I, I can only imagine. Now I want to go teleport there and just listen to that whole tape right there. Jeez. <laughs> The, and, those days of of making tapes at your house, Raj. I mean, let's start with that. I mean, do you still make tapes? Like, do you still? I mean, I'm sure you do for yourself, but like, do you make people tapes anymore? Occasionally, you know. I think the cassette was one of the top five inventions of the 20th century. It played a great role in revolutions. It was the way that my fellow radio broadcasters back in the late 70s and 80s changed material because the pressings of Jamaican records, as you both know, were so small generally that if you had a copy of a record, most of your friends probably 
never even saw that record to buy. Mm -hmm. So we would trade tapes and you would come over to the house, Devin, and you would make copies of my tapes. Yep. And I always had those either two to one or four to one duplicating machines. Mm -hmm. And um, I think of it as uh, uh, revolutionary because the Ayatollah used to uh, circulate his revolutionary overthrow the Shah speeches on cassettes when he was in exile. And he ended up taking over Iran. And the Russians uh, would listen to the Beatles on cassettes. And uh, a long time ago, Gorbachev was quoted as saying that it was listening to the Beatles' music that helped him overturn the communist regime in Russia. Jeez. Wow. <laughs> and, and there are numerous examples of this around the world. Cassettes were, were the medium of, of turning governments over. Right. But also of spreading the best work of Jamaicans. I mean, I don't think I've ever seen a physical copy of, of uh, the rulers, Wrong and Boyo. And, and another thing came to mind. See, I'm old. And uh, I'll tell you how old I am. Okay. I have a good friend in Jamaica I've known for over 40 years. And when I was last there about a year ago, I saw him again. And he, like me, has become a long, white-haired cat with a, a white beard <laughs> and i said yeah man i'm an elder now and he says no roger man you an ancient <laughs> <laughs> but i remember when lloyd price had a huge hit top five hit with stagger lee right and because of dick clark that square bastard i have no respect for <laughs> uh, love it he had to recut the record stagger lee shot billy he shot that poor boy so bad they made him change it to Stagger Lee said, Billy, Billy, why you treat me so bad? They had to clean the record up to play it on, on the American bandstand. Well, like you guys, I've always been into the more rutical, actual words of, of the deep root songs in Jamaica. And right. I marvel just listening for the beginning of the show tonight to the two of you talk about labels and stuff. And, uh, you know, I have a lot to learn from you both. I mean, I learned all this at your house. Here's a copy of that, um, the Wrong and Boyo. Nice. Right here. Oh, oh um, no kidding. Yeah. yeah. I, wow. Yeah. That's an interesting JJ label. I don't know if I've seen that. Right, um, right. It's and it's got, this, this is another song that's on that tape on the flip side, Why Don't You Change. It's it's probably the next tape, on uh, the next song on that. Wow. <laughs> Flip side on the UK Rio label mm -hmm. is the mm. one you heard. Yeah, that's yeah, trip. yeah. That's the one that most people have. Most people have the real one, as I've I've found out. Because I've done a lot of asking about the rulers because they're so good, and you can't. I can't find out any information. I don't know if you know anything about them, Raj. No. Which Raj? Oh, sorry, we got two Rajs. <laughs> you call, call me number two. Just call me number two. This whole time. <laughs> call me two. Okay, I'll be number two. When I was in Vietnam, I was in the PSYOPs division, and we used to go out on these little planes with a, uh, a hole cut into the fuselage and drop propaganda leaflets over the Viet Cong. And I'd sit next to the pilot, and every other word out of his mouth was, Roger. And I'd go, yes, sir. Oh, shut up. I'm not talking to the pilot. <laughs> oh, no. Right? Oh, we, really we, we get so used to I mean, Roger's not a super-duper <laughs> common name, so we get used to being... Uh, unique in our own rights, but it's always great to, to meet another Roger well, for was, sure. What was interesting also to me, because uh, we are all, I'm sure, influenced at least a little bit by David Rodigan. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, there you go. He's, he's a very good friend, and his mother uh, and my mother both called us by the same name when we were little boys, Roddy. Mm. My mom was from a British background, and I was Roddy to her, so Roddy and Roddy. He's kind of well, like the British, and I'm kind of like the American Rodigan. <laughs> have either of you read his book yet yes ram jam i think it's called it's ram jam not no it's really good yeah. you have it yeah. roger uh, at your uh, roger number two you have yeah, it at your, at your house over there i i told you Devin. i only get the books for the pictures if this, you know there's no they're just <laughs> he's got he's got a he's got a giant stack of great reggae books in his studio for when I people so. come roger of course if they have pictures in them i'm there i'm getting it i'm telling you well, i've got no i'm joking <laughs> I, I've got oh. some some right here. This well, hold is, on, hold on, real quick. I'm okay. just, let me see. Let me see. Go ahead. Keep okay. Talking. Well, while you're looking for the books, this is 
I definitely, I mean, there's so much, we're just going to be all over the place with this interview, but you know, this is, I remember when you put this out, the reggae scrapbook, um, Roger Steffens and Peter Simon's reggae scrapbook. And this is one of the coolest, I mean, books, just things like this is one of the coolest things I've ever seen. Like, how did you, I mean, first of all, could you explain for people who have not seen this kind of like what the reggae scrapbook is? It's a multimedia book. It begins with a DVD inside the front cover. Right. which has an hour of excerpts from my old L.A. reggae TV show, interviews with Luciano on his first tour of America, uh, interviews with Alton Ellis about uh, yes. the people who ripped him off, culture telling how um, he was mugged at night, uh, oh, coming back from a ground nation, and uh, the, the uh, very brief reunion of the Heptones, all of that stuff is in the DVD. And then there's all kinds of pullouts. There's postcards, yeah, there's pictures. Um, and the back of the book is a wonderful poster that I'm looking at the original of right now. It's from Gdansk, Poland. And it's a solidarity, anti-apartheid, human rights reggae concert in the shipyards where solidarity mm. was born in uh, December of uh, 1989. And uh, we reproduced that as a huge poster tucked into the back of the book. But it's great pictures by my old friend the late photographer peter simon and um interviews i did with uh, gregory isaacs and uh, <laughs> the black uhuru in the early days and lots of great stories it's it's a, a a history of reggae music in short bites great pictures and lots of artifacts from my reggae archives yeah it's it's cool for me with like the first time i flipped through it is seeing stuff that i recognized from your archives like this poster this dance hall poster i know everyone can't see this watching but it's got a list of artists and one of them his name is ja chew stick and i yes. remember you telling me that it's like such such a good name ja chew stick ja chew stick it's taken yeah. darn it i was gonna take him yeah you can't use it right well that's a good book but i have another nice book right here too Ooh. Uh, you know, I just heard from someone yesterday who was trying to find a copy of the discography that Leroy Jody Pearson and I did. He said there's a copy uh, on, uh, I guess, eBay for $140. I believe it. Oh, yeah. I believe it. I believe it, too. I was trying to find – I lost my copy of People Funny Boy by David Katz, mm -hmm. and I was trying yeah. to find one, and, yeah, they go for hundreds of dollars. Expensive. Expensive. Yeah. yeah. It's just it's insane. I bought mine in – no, go ahead. I say what's insane is that the publisher in Jamaica for the Jamaican edition of the book has hundreds of copies sitting in oh, his no warehouse. Kidding. And he probably would ask 10 bucks for it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no now, kidding. That this book came about uh, when uh, Leroy and I were doing the uh, autobiography interviews with uh, Bunny Whaler. And the, the discography came out of those interviews because in, back in October of 1990, Leroy and I sat for three weeks in a hotel room with Bunny playing every single song the Whalers had ever made and getting the personnel and all the information about every single track. And mm -hmm. that's what that discography book represents. And it is to this day, 30 years later, the only true discography that uh, ever existed for any Jamaican artist. I have the uh, Jamaican wow. version here with a little nice. different cover. They, they uh -huh. rejiggered the cover. Right, um, right. But it's, it's a classic college textbook version of what a true discography is, which is the name of the singers on the, on the song, the right. instrumentalists, Before what they played, the number of tracks on the master tape <laughs> back wow. in the day. The name of the engineer, the studio, the producer, the matrix number in the wax for each of the pressings around the world. And right. that's crucially important because you can have the same label on a Coxon record and have, in, in some cases, three different versions of the same song. Yep. And the only way you know, other than listening carefully to it, is by looking at the matrix number carved in the wax between uh, the end of the song and the beginning of the label. And mm -hmm. it usually says F something, like FC would be for Coxon. And you would see like 1619-1 or dash three. That meant the first take was on one record and the third take was on, an, on the same record with the same label. So it's really crucial information. And then 
the color sections with with all the labels uh, for, so for every record it. that they ever did. That was a lot of fun to put together. It was a labor of love. We worked on it for a combined, I think, thirty-seven years before it went right. before we could find anybody who would publish it. And wow. um, I think I think it'll last. But I, I just hate the these huge prices. It should be ten bucks to anybody who wanted. It. Mm -hmm. <laughs> exactly. I mean, I jumped on it, and you you pretty much nailed it. As anybody that collects records, as anybody that's a fan of of knowing who played on what track, I mean, it came down to well, Roland Alfonso played on this song and whatnot, you know. So it oh wow. I mean, it's it's a, such a treasured book, and like you said, I think everyone should. Is it on ebook? Are are your books? How, how does that work? Are, are the majority or all of them? Uh, are they available electronically? Is that yeah, my book ebooks there's there's too much tactility to the books i do i know? love it okay i love it i love it i love In fact, it copeland forbes says his favorite reggae book of all time is the reggae scrapbook <laughs> oh it's a beautiful i book. mean you really can't i don't it's in a tier of its own there's no other book like it right right how did you th how did you guys think of that i mean are there other books and other genres that are similar yeah a publishing company up in marin county uh which does a lot of motion picture tie-ins uh, did books like that, things with mm. things you can pull and keep. And they approached Peter Simon, and uh, Peter brought me aboard because uh, he, he doesn't feel that confident about his writing. Uh, so I became uh, not only the, the writer of most of the book, we brought in a young woman who was really into dance hall, which neither Peter nor I were. Uh, named Molly Fire, and she covered the dance hall scene. And Roy Sweetland, the great photographer from Jamaica, um, has his own little book within our book of dance hall pictures. And um, I did, you know, the bulk of the writing in the book and provided numerous uh, artifacts to be reproduced and photographed mm -hmm. throughout throughout the book. It's, it's a collect, it's not meant to be an encyclopedia or a, a formal history, but it starts in the earliest days of Ska and works all the way up to 2005 when we published the book. There is now a paperback version of the book, but it has none of the pullouts. Oh, and really? So if you if you buy a copy, yeah. So if you buy a copy on eBay, insist that it is the hardcover, and insist that it's new, so it has all the stuff inside that somebody hasn't pulled out ah, all the bumper stickers. Right. Ah. The, yeah. I bought. In fact, see, Vanessa. So they could pull out all the stuff and paste it. I was just going to say, so I was just going to say that my wife, uh, Vanessa, bought me a copy and then I bought a second copy because I wanted to hang up all the things. But then I never ended up doing that either. I just I couldn't bring myself to like. So I've got like I've got two copies. Of it. <laughs> there you go. Speaking of books, is it fair to I mean, I, so much things to say the oral history of Bob Marley. This book. And I've yet, I've yet to get my copy, but I've heard so many good things about it, and I need to get my copy. Shame on you! I know, shame years. on me. And What's I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna try to explain it. Can you please give us the rundown of why this book is special and is different from from the other ones? Well, you know, there are now over 700 books cataloged by my friend Joe Jurgensen, who's already done one bibliography years ago and is now working on the second edition to add all the hundreds that have come out since. Over 700 Bob Marley books in several languages. Um, I've done seven. The latest is the summation of my life's work. It's my magnum opus. It took me 15 years to write, which involved a computer crash that took everything, and I had to start all over again and do all the transcriptions again. Uh -huh. um, it is, a, well, let me quote Kwame Dawes, who wrote Bob Marley, Lyrical Genius. He's a, a brilliant poet and actor and professor, uh, Ghanaian, Jamaican. And he got a, an advanced copy of the book, and he gave me a beautiful blurb. He said, this book is a triumph of the storytelling virtuosity of the Jamaican people. In other words, it's the anti-Timothy White mythological book it is a book of 75 jamaicans bob and his closest friends telling me their stories about their personal interactions with bob marley it is almost all 75 jamaican people telling bob's wow. story in jamaican's words and i i love that 
that exists because of Jamaican people. And there are a lot of contradictions in there, uh, <laughs> almost from the first days of his life. And, you know, you'll have three or four people who were in the room at the same time telling the story. And there's very little agreement among all four of them. So I Can don't you know. Can you pick one of those contradictions that kind of stuck out to you where you're like, well, wait a minute, this is oh, yeah. this is vastly yeah, different. The, it, it was the, the, the date of the first recording session for Coxon. Oh. Coxon swears it was weeks after the audition. Um, Seiko Patterson says it was the next morning. Uh, Beverly says it was uh, maybe a week. Uh, and they were all there. And, hmm. and Bunny comes up with a different story. So there, there are at least four different tales of, of when that session took place. The least reliable memory is Coxon, because he was a juicer. And I don't think his, his memory is very secure. <laughs> right. um, but, you know, I, I think Bunny had a very good memory 30 years ago when, when we did our interviews with him. So it's, it's a fascinating book from that angle. My original concept was totally different, which is why it took so long finally to bring it out. Um, I, I approached Norton, which had already done two books with me, uh, uh, the one I did with Bruce Talleman. Uh, um, uh, I'll think in a second what our, our book was called. Uh, a Dream... Uh, why don't, you know, my first book. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. I should know uh, it. I'm blanking on it too. Dream, whatever. So uh, it'll come to me all of a sudden. And mm -hmm. then I did One Love with Lee Jaffe. Right. And uh, so I pitched Norton. Um, and I said, I have 110 interviews with people who knew Bob well. And I want this to be the raw material for historians. I want to publish each interview in the order in which the questions were asked so you saw the mm -hmm. context mm -hmm. and they bought it and then when i presented them with the first draft eventually i signed the contract in 2002 and in 2011 i sent them the first draft wow with, with the computer <laughs> crash in between of course right and they said well we like it but th this is not the format we want we want the classic oral history format. So I had to reconstruct the entire thing. In other words, we took the Smile Jamaica assassination attempt and we got all the different people involved in that event and took the principal parts of the interviews and tried to tell a story with firsthand information. And that took another five years or so. Mm -hmm. So uh, the book finally came out in 2017 and Rolling Stone God bless him, said it was the, probably the best Bob Marley book ever. So that, that really wow. touched my heart. Wow. Because I've been reading Rolling Stone since volume one, one uh, number one, which I bought on Telegraph Avenue in Berkeley the day before I was shipped to Vietnam in the army in November of 67. Wow. Wow. And I subscribed the minute I got to Saigon. And as Devin knows, I've got an entire collection from, from then, uh, 53 years of Rolling Stone. Mm -hmm. You might have even sorted some of those for me at one point, Devin. Do you remember? It's possible. I'm, I there was a little period while I was come where I was coming over and digitizing a lot of uh, oh, wow. vinyl and helping with this and that. Just any excuse I could get to come over. Um, I don't remember if I did the Rolling Stone, but it's very possible. Yeah, Roger but, put you to work. I love it. I mean, so, there's no better place <laughs> to work. Roger's house is like reggae Disneyland. It's I mean, right, I'm gonna take a pass. The reggae. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Back. It's like it's like you know what I need the yeah, I need the the the, the I mean, lawn lawn mode too, Devin. Can you can you mow the lawn? Okay? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <It's> so good. <laughs> so Devin, have you read the book? There's so much things to say. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Got it here, and I read it as soon as it came out. Um, yeah, just like what you're. I'm just listening to you, and that's exactly what struck me about it. Um. You know, I, not so much. Yeah, I, I noticed some of the contradictions, but it's exactly what you were saying that it's it's the story told by Jamaicans who were there. And so that that in and of itself makes it makes it unique. And it makes yeah. it um, I mean, it sounds silly to say, but it makes it authentic. You know, <laughs> it's because it's being told in the words of the people who were there. And and um, I think that's one of the things that you have always been able to do maybe better than most other people is 
is get those stories out of people because of the relationships you've been able to develop with, uh, with so many, you know, the great Jamaican artists. Uh, and that comes through in the book for sure. Well, you know, you, you guys are good at what you do too, because you really know the music inside out and you also have collections that you can come and show to the artist when you're <laughs> talking and they really respect that. And, and one of the things I miss most about our local club, the Dub Club, um, is that uh, Tom Chastain, who r run or ran it, uh, would bring in a lot of the real rudical artists that mm -hmm. very few in the reggae community even know about. But the Chicano artist uh, uh, following really fascinates me. The, the crowds are probably, you know, overwhelmingly... Uh, first generation Mexican, Central American people. Yep. And uh, they know that music, the ska era especially. And I remember going into the dressing room one night, and I can't remember who the artist was, but it was somebody like Laurel Aitken, one of the real originators. And he was in the dressing room after his set, and there were tears pouring down his cheeks. And he said, I didn't think anybody remembered me. Wow. And it was so wonderful that that caliber of artist was what, what Tom brought to the dub club. It was really great. These people knew toward the end of their careers that their work was going to last. Right. I and agree. You guys, especially, you know, the band you've been with Devin and uh, just really creative uh, reimagining of, of some of the, the best material that you make ever produced sometimes 50 or more years ago. Mm -hmm. Well, like I always tell people, I, I learned about this music at, at your house um, and also from, from Chuck Foster's show. Those are really the two places. And, you know, we, we had the opportunity to back some, you know, some great artists at Dub Club over the years. We played with Leonard Dillon of the Ethiopians, wow. uh, you know, Vernon. Do you remember, Roger? I'm sure you do. This is one of my favorite days ever was when we came to, your, came to the archives with Leonard and Vernon of the Maytones. Yeah. And, um, and Ben came and... Um, I'm pretty sure your son Devin was there and that was just, that was some of my favorite days in the archives were when artists would show up, you know, and, and that day to be able to bring someone was just like a really like proud moment for us, I think, to bring Leonard and, and Vernon and, you know, watch you like do your thing where you get all your stacks of records and have, you know, Leonard sign all the seven inches while he tells you stories about each one. It's so great. I think you already had most of them signed by him at that point, but yeah, you got some, you got some more signed that day, I think, but. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I learned the hardest lesson when I was traveling with Bob Marley. Uh, Hank and I had just started the reggae beat <clears throat> on October 7th, 1979. And in the middle of November, Island Records called us because we had the only reggae show on in all of L.A. Right. And they said, would you mind going on the road with Bob Marley for two weeks? <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think we could do that. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, I carried around a bag of all his records that I had. And I had a lot of rare stuff out of England at that point. Uh, most, not most, but a, a good selection of Coxon and Whalen Solem. And I, I kept waiting for a little five to 10 minute period with Bob during those two weeks when I could ask him to sign my records. And he was always being hit on. And when we were on the bus together, we were under orders by his manager, Don Taylor, not to talk to Bob. Mm -hmm. And of course, the first day that we drove from L.A. to San, Francisco, to San Diego, he got on the bus and sat one mile behind us just across the aisle. And there he is. And I'm not supposed to say hello to him. <laughs> um, wow. wow. So I had this bag of records the whole time. And there never came a time when when it was just hey, Bob, now that you're not too busy, would you sign my records? But we were friends, and uh, I figured he came to L.A. every year. Eh, next year when he comes back, I'll, I got mm -hmm. my record signed. Mm -hmm. And he never came back. So everybody who came to town after that, I was like stink on shit, as they say colloquially. Yep. Um, right. And Peter, I got my whole Peter collection signed. Well, you know, Devin, you've been yep. through the singles. Um, I've probably got 70 Alton Ellis records signed. I've got Joe yeah. Higgs and, and Jimmy Cliff duets signed by both of them talking it's, about it's, the other person. And, you know, they, now, they, they, it makes it very, very special. to me. Now, now, I can imagine at that point, right, you go up to the artist, you have a stack of 45s. And tell us about, yeah. I'm sure some of these artists are looking at these 45 singles and, 
and going, man, I don't even remember recording oh, this. More I'm... than I mean, uh, the first person Hank and I ever did the, the interview with was a month before the reggae beat came on the air in early September of '79. Uh, <laughs> can I tell you a funny Peter Tosh story? Please, please do. <laughs> All right. So. Peter, uh, Bob, and eventually Peter had one of the great characters in the history of music business publicity men. And his name was Charlie Comer. And he was a, a garrulous, old, florid-faced Irishman from Liverpool. And in the mm. 60s, he worked for John Lennon and Mick Jagger. In the 70s, he was Bob's chief publicist. And uh, Peter, through the 70s and all through the 80s, he just adored Peter Tosh. And I met him when I was doing my first reggae writing for um, Warren Smith's Reggae News. I don't know if you guys ever saw a copy of that, you know, newsprint, Reggae News. And then my first reggae articles ever were in there. And so uh, Charlie heard about me through Reggae News and called me in September and says, Peter's in your town. And he's got no herb. Can you help him out, Roger? And I said, well, Charlie, as a matter of fact, I've just come back from a plantation in Santa Cruz. And wow. my friend who grows had two 16-foot plant colas, you know, the tops of the plants. Yeah. And he gave them to me. And uh, Charlie gave me the room number at the Sunset Marquee where most of the reggae guys used to stay and said, Peter will be waiting for you, Roger. So wow. Mary wrapped this two foot long cola in beautiful paper, put a red, gold and green ribbon around it. And off we go to the sunset marquee and we knock on the door and Peter's got a chain on the door and he peels the chain back and he looks out and sees me there with this huge thing in my hands. And he says, oh, what not? I said, well, it's a gift to you, Bush doctor, from the herb smokers of California. So he ran, takes off the chain, grabs me, pulls me in, grabs Mary, pulls her in, chains the door again, all in about five seconds. And I hand him the package and he rips a little of the paper and he sees what's inside. And so he takes the red, gold and green ribbon off, takes all the paper off and he holds it in both hands and... Um, I'm trying to get this into the picture. It's backwards. There you go. So he, he gets he gets the thing in his two hands and he breaks a piece off and he smells it and he looks down the barrel of it and finally he turns to me with this huge, huge cola in his hand. It'd be five thousand bucks today for that, you know? And he looks at <laughs> right. me and says he looks at me and he says, Sure, take a whole lot more than this to get my propeller spin. Oh no. <laughs> Oh no, jeez! But he didn't give it back. But he didn't give it back. <laughs> no. He's like, this is just so, yeah. So what were we talking about before that? About the records being signed. So, oh know, yeah, would, yeah, I yeah. Bring all his new records, I would bring with me, and he would he would sign all of them. He was really good to me. He was, nice. you know, he called me right before he was killed. Wow. He used to call me three or four times every year. Uh, because he had no records. They'd all been stolen off him or borrowed off him for good. And um, so he knew that I had this, this big collection. And he would call me three or four times a year from various parts of the world. And he'd say, uh, do you have uh, Maga Dog? Yeah, I got Maga Dog. Which version? <laughs> you know? And I got Skanky Dog, too. Uh, wow. So he'd tell me what he wanted. And I'd tape it and overnight it to him wherever he was. And just before he died... He called me, and no nuclear war had come out that week, his last album. Mm -hmm. And he wanted me to send him a copy of the Joe Gibbs version of Here Comes the Judge, which mm. is the record on which he identifies Bartholomew de los Casas and Henry Morgan right. and all the... the it, it's a whole court men. scene. It's, it's a whole court scene, right? It's like a... Yeah. Yeah, it's a great so, tune. It's he in that tradition of the court scene. There's a lot of court scene songs, and that's my favorite one. Over the Sata Masagana rhythm, yeah. too, like a really janky version yeah. of it. Anyway, go on. Sorry. Yeah. So he, he wanted to redo it for his next album. Now that No Nuclear War, which had been in the can for like four years, had finally come out, he was working on his next album. But he wanted to change all the names to the current villains of history. 
Um, I don't know if he ever got a chance to lay a demo. I, I don't think so. But that mm -hmm. would have been an interesting record to hear who, who he thought the bad guys were now. Right. I, wow. I, I wanted to ask you more about Peter Tosh because I know I know he was an artist that you had a pretty close relationship with. And just, yeah. you know, could you tell us a little bit about like what Peter was like as a I mean, because all of us, you know, see the, the, the you know, the militant musician. Um, he kind of comes off as like somebody who I might be intimidated to talk to. But, I, you know, I wonder, like, if you could share, like, what he was like, you know, if just from someone who knew him pretty well. Yeah, it's interesting. I've been a lot about that lately because I have a, a new young friend in North Carolina named Saul Ramirez, who, who may be watching right now, um, who is very active with the Tasha State and knows a heck of a lot about him. And uh, I just I treasured my friendship with Peter Peter who was uh, on camera and there was Peter who was hanging out and sharing spliffs with you and I I found both of them interesting but he scared people and Bunny Whaler got very angry with me in one of the interviews I did for a documentary film where I talked about Peter being scary but he was he was scary to people in Babylon he was intimidating very intimidating and a lot of American blacks didn't like Peter Tosh at all. Uh, he was reminding them of their roots, and they didn't care to be reminded in the 80s uh, mm. about their roots. So um, Peter privately was one of the funniest people I've ever known in my life. And we all know that through his use and uh, deconstruction, <laughs> like a French intellectual of the English language. Right. And in box set that I, I was one of the producers of uh, called Honorary Citizen. I Great. Sure I, love, I, I love that one. Oh, thank you. Well, I may, I had a whole page of words of the herbalist verbalist. You know, he didn't play in, in Los Angeles. He played in Hell A uh, or Follywood. <laughs> and mm -hmm. he played in San Francisco, California, United States of Asadica, because there's nothing merry about America. It's Asadica. And wow. the grudge was the judge, and his manager was his damager, and his producer was his reducer. And I found out a phrase that I think within two days of my turning in the final uh, text for the liner notes that I would have assuredly uh, maybe put it at the head of the list of words of the herbalist verbalist. He called Queen Elizabeth, Queen Ear Liza Bitch. Dang, <laughs> that's some points right there. Yeah, he's wow. And the the system was the shitstim. That was a Peter Tosh thing, right? The shitstim. Yeah. Judge yeah. was the grudge. Yeah. Jeez. He he was pricelessly funny, and and he was an intellectual, but he can also be mm -hmm. stubborn as hell. Mm. I don't know. You know, you you've probably seen my Peter Tosh interviews from the L.A. Reggae Show on the internet. Mm -hmm. Have you ever watched those? Yep. I've seen some, yes. You know, because the, the second one was in 83. And um, that was right when Mama Africa came out. And I brought a bunch of records for him to sign. And he was saying, you know, we were never Bob Marley in the records till Blood Clot Chris Blackwell told us that. And I said, Peter, I have a copy of Simmer Down accredited to Bob and the Whalers. Mm -hmm. You know, you're talking your first records. I mean, there's all kinds of Bob and the Whalers on Coxon. And you right. had your own label in 1966, Whale and Solemn. You could put anything you wanted on your label. And it all said Bob Marley and the Wailing Whalers. And Cox, you know, the, the Lee Perry albums. Oh, Lee, you know, Bob Marley and the, the Whalers. Mm -hmm. It wasn't until you <laughs> went to Chris Blackwell that... Catch a Fire came out called The Whalers. And then the follow-up, Burnin, The Whalers. Mm -hmm, and people mm -hmm. have criticized me terribly for putting Peter on the spot and being so insolent to the great Peter Tosh. Well, that's bullshit. Nah. Yeah. I was talking truth to him, and he appreciated it. And, well, he seems, and he seems like someone that would, you know. I know you mentioned that he is intimidating at times. Did you ever notice that he was like the alpha within the trio of Bob, Peter, and Bunny? Was he, I don't want to say he punked Bob or, or Bunny, but did he have that kind of alpha status? They all were alphas, let's face it. They were the Beatles. Each of the Beatles had, right. you know, 
really great solo careers. To this day, McCartney and, and Ringo have very active, successful careers. Oh, yeah. um, and that's why the center couldn't hold. There were three great talents. Bob was getting all of his songs on the albums. The others were getting practically nothing. Mm -hmm. Bob would try to uh, make that better by, uh, for example, um, in Get Up, Stand Up, he asked Peter to add a verse to it. And that's the line, sick and tired of this bullshit game, die and go to heaven in Jesus' name. So Peter would get a, a cut of the writer's royalty for Get Up, Stand Up. But, mm. you know, they, they had catalogs of, of records. And I mean, <laughs> Bunny, Bunny wrote Pass It On in 1962 and wanted wow. to, to bring it to Leslie Kong for a session and couldn't get out of school in time. So Kong wouldn't let him in the studio. He sat on that record for 10 years before it came out. That's a trip. Uh, they, they had incredible catalogs of songs ready to go. And we saw that. Well, look at the first album Bunny did as a soloist. You know, that, that Blackheart Man is one of the mm -hmm. greatest albums of, of all time. Spirit really? Dancer. Spirit Dancer. That there was you go. <laughs> <laughs> you knew it was going to kick right. you. Yes, yes, yes. I knew it was going to kick you. There you go. <laughs> A little bit of CRS disease. <laughs> So you still have all those tapes, I assume, of uh, of Bunny Whaler, uh, the interviews you did with him, right? And in fact, um, they're being they're being digitized for me right now. Wow! There's, for, I think oh. all together sixty four hours of uh, autobiography sessions. And so I know played everything. Wow! And I I know you had told me over the years there was there were reasons why like those weren't able to be made public. Has anything changed with that? The, the the audio from those tapes? No, it's too bad. Yeah. Now, Bunny Bunny canceled the project ten years into it. Um, oh. we, you know, we we did sixty four hours over a three week period. One session lasted fourteen hours, and all Bunny did was drink water. Um, and whenever we talked about a period of the music, he brought in musicians who played on the songs with him. Mm -hmm. So we got the personnel from the people who were in the studio, and that's pretty trustworthy information. Um, as I say, all together, I think we did 64 hours of interview up at Dreamland, his estate and in the hotel in Kingston. Um, and so you had to, you know, maybe in hour 13, we got into Rude Boy, and in hour 23, we got another look at the Rude Boy from a different angle. Mm -hmm. And so we had to synthesize all those different pieces into one coherent whole and put it as close to Bunny's real voice as possible, but also standard English enough that people weren't going to just put the book down and say, I can't follow this. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Right. So, um, we, we wrote three chapters, one about his imprisonment and another about the time when they all returned to Nine Mile in 1966 when Bob had the writer's block and uh, another one about their touring with Johnny Nash in England. And we sent it to him and we didn't hear from him. And time went by and his band leader, Carl Ayton, the drummer, uh, told me privately at a gig that Bunny wasn't going to finish the book, that he was going to abandon the project, but this he never he never had the courtesy to tell me and Leroy. And finally, two years later, he called me and I said, well, what did you think of the ch chapters I sent you? He says, well, I haven't read them. What? He says, why don't you come to Miami and read them to me? And I said, <laughs> Bunny, what are you, five years old? Right. You know. We can't proceed until we get your approval that this is the kind of voice you want your book in and how you want it to sound. Uh -huh. And then I never heard from him again for years and years. So that was the greatest disappointment of my reggae life. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Hold on a second. He, oh, yeah, we're holding, <laughs> we're holding on. Devin, yeah. it was freaking Roger Steffens, man. This is, this is awesome. It's there's great, so many, yeah. and there's so much I want to ask. There's so much I want to ask. You see you this there? book? Yeah. That? That's yeah. 1,800 pages of Bunny's autobiography. Jeez. That every hardcore reggae fan, this is just, you know, my little top thing Jeez. here. Jeez. It fills the box. box I'm coming bridge. over. I said, I'm coming over with that KFC. I'll bring 18... some Kentucky Fried Chicken, and we're going to grub on that. 
story every major reggae fan, Whalers fan, wants to read. Jeez. Do you feel, I want to ask you about that, Roger. I mean, you feel like, uh, my impression is that you have, you know, Bob Marley and the Whalers, and they go through many, many examples of being fucked over, right? That's so the do whole you think, book. I'm sure. Do you think that that kind of serves as the blueprint for just them being able to commit or follow through or, or be stoked or happy about any given project. I mean, over the time, you know, with the Lee Perry thing, and I'd love for you to touch on each one of these, right? Because, you know, Coxon, correct me if I'm wrong, Coxon screwed him, right? And so did Lee Perry to a certain extent, right? And then Blackwell, yep. right? And the, Oh, yeah. So so I'm just assuming. And Leslie you, Kong up and died. <laughs> oh, no, not Leslie Kong. <laughs> she was. So you get enough of that, and you just have to, it just has to set a brother to be like, you know what? I'm not like super stoked about any given project. I mean, and that's just assumption. It is. And that's the story I tell in the book. Uh, you got it exactly right, Raj. Um, Coxton, the most important producer in that period of time, along with Prince Buster, of course. Um, first sessions for Coxton, these kids walk into the studio and who's playing backup for them? Don Drummond and the Scatolites. My Amazing. God, jeez! And and they did over a hundred songs for Coxon, and he never paid him more than three pounds a week. And when they finally left the label, he gave them ninety nine pounds each. Man, they Bob goes into exile in America, comes back with a little money, but enough for them to start their own Wayland Soldom label. They never can get enough money in front of them to to really achieve what they wanted to do was to make enough money to have a big house where all of them lived together and they had a studio downstairs and whenever the inspiration hit day or night they could go down and record their music and market it themselves instead you know rita and bob rode around kingston in bicycles with boxes <laughs> of records on the handlebars i mean that's how crude and and you know unprofessional as, as you can get in the recording business so um, that didn't work for them. Right. And, and they, they go to Leslie Kong, who's had those huge sellers with my boy Lollipop and Israelites, and they think he can really bring them to the level where they want to be. And mm -hmm. they make an album of originals for Leslie Kong, and before it can really take off, Kong dies. And then is they that, go is to that, Lee is that, I'm sorry to interject, because I want to get to Lee Perry. Is that like the, the soul shakedown, uh, uh, back out, do it yeah. twice? Yeah. That that is uh, I've talked Cheer to Devin up. about this many Boston, times. Road, that road. is my favorite era. Bunny, of Bob Marley Bunny likes that because it doesn't sound like anything else, and it was uh, uh, an album of pep talks to themselves. You know, like do it twice is on that album. Go tell it mm -hmm. on the mountain. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, the, all the professional push behind it died with him, with, right. with uh, Leslie. So then they turn in desperation to Lee Perry. And they have a handshake agreement that everything is going to be divided 50-50 between them. And it's all spelled out in the book. But, uh, of course, that that proved to be uh, untrue, shall we say. So right. they're, they're desperate at this point. And Danny Sims is concurrent with those four years from 68 to 72. He's got an international superstar with Johnny Nash, who's recording Bob Marley compositions. They signed the Whalers mainly as writers for Johnny, but also released some singles that can't get any airplay in America because they sound so weird to American ears. And uh, his, the Whalers records come out almost as bootlegs in England on the Trojan label. And they, never, they come back home and they don't see any money from all of this. And um, in desperation, they, they turn to Blackwell. Danny Sims sells their contract, which he had sold to Columbia Records. Columbia didn't know what to do with them, so they, they took a little override on whatever Island would make on their music and allowed Danny to resell their contract to Island Records and Chris Blackwell in the fall of 1972. And Blackwell gives them 8,000 pounds which was the daily cocaine budget for Eric Clapton and tells him <laughs> yes. to make an album. 
and that album is is catch a fire and it it mm -hmm. it's a critical lick and um the whalers break up they're just about to go huge on the international scene and the center cannot hold um blackwell says to them i'll uh, while you're recording your second album in in the winter of 1973 um you can tour Jama uh, England, and when you're not touring, you can be in the studio making your record, and I'll take care of all your expenses. And when the tour was over and they were about to go back to Jamaica, Blackwell gave them a bill for thousands and thousands of pounds, which he said they owed him. Jeez. And, you know, Peter... Peter just lost it. That was the main blow for Peter eventually leaving. But Bunny quit on the spot because wow. Blackwell also said he was going to play them in freak clubs. And he didn't want to be around freaks. So he, <laughs> he went back to Jamaica for a 13-year off-island exile. He didn't leave Jamaica until 1986. Do you so there, that, that exactly the rise and fall that you were referring to, Roger, um, is... is bringing them to the point where how can we really trust Blackwell or anybody exactly. else? Every yeah. fucking buddy has ripped us off. Right. And it's so ironic then that Bunny signs with him right away to do burning and protest right. on Island. I don't know. There's... Yeah. It's like when I talked to Bunny about touring with the bandwagon for the PNP in 71 and early 72 in the election that brought Michael Manley to power. And I said, so you were supporting Michael Manley? He says, no, how can you say that? I said, well, you're on the bandwagon. You're singing, attracting a crowd, and then he comes on stage and makes his campaign speech. He said, well, that doesn't mean we supported him. The only reason we did the bandwagon is they paid, paid us more money than anybody ever paid us, $150 a night. Wow. Oh, geez. <laughs> more than anybody. Jeez. That's, is, there, is there anybody for whom, like, any artist that you can think of for whom that wasn't the case? I mean, we hear, you know, artist after artist, the story of them getting ripped off by whoever the producer was in Jamaica at the time. Is there any artist that that didn't happen to who like <laughs> has some kind of like success story with their finances at that time from music? It just seems like That's I want a their really, the really good question. And I've been interviewing people for 47 years now. And I can't Would you think say, a, I'm, I'm going to interject real quick because one person I, who doesn't feel ripped off. I would say, I mean, I would assume you have some of these role players like a Prince Buster that has his own label, like a Derek Harriet. Um, that's my assumption that maybe those artists would have been a little more. Well, um, then they get ripped off by the distributors. Exactly, exactly. You know, so like we, we've had B.B. Seaton on the show. We've had Larry McDonald and they've, they've touched on this. As far as Jamaican musicians, what, what know, did they getting... say? Did they say <laughs> hardly anybody? Well, no, yeah, exactly, exactly. No, they haven't touched on the exact answer to the question, but what they did touch on was a gentleman that seemed to be the teacher of so many things, and Mr. Joe Higgs. Joe Higgs, yeah. be the teacher well, of Higgs not only <laughs> vocally, not not that he would be the artist, but but the impression that like Larry McDonald gave and everything was that. He not only would, would teach the groups, you know, harmonies and all that, but he would also kind of educate them more so about the business. On their rights, yeah. And so right. he, he never really had any huge hits because the uh, producers hated him. He was telling the other artists about the rights that they had. Well, and I never thought about that. Bear, there you go. Bear in mind the fact that he died penniless in a welfare hospital in L.A. at the end of 1999. So he, he, he had him. his own country, right? but what good did it do? Right. That's, yeah. Well, I never thought about that connection of like why the connection between Joe Higgs never having too many big hits and him actively uh, educating artists about how to keep their, their royalties and stuff like that. That's really interesting. Our friend James from Giant Panda Gorilla Dub Squad is in the comments and he wants to know, what about Jimmy Cliff? Like, was Jimmy Cliff maybe an artist that, had some success when others were getting ripped off? Well, you know, he, he had the albums with, um, with Chris in the early 70s. And uh, I don't think he felt that he was being treated right. And he left the label at, at the absolute height of his international um, recognition uh -huh. and turned Islamic uh -huh. and made... Kind of pop 
records and right. lost his his momentum because the harder they come came out at the same time as catch a fire uh -huh. and those were two of the, the major punches that that brought reggae to world attention um you know he he has his own company and and he takes care of his own business i think he's done all right eventually but it took him more than a decade to to learn how to navigate the music business and not be ripped off as every, at every st stage of the way right there's and I know Bernie guy in 76 right. on our first trip to Jamaica, and he couldn't have been nicer. Joe Higgs and Bob and Ernest Wranglin. We were right after one of the major stars in reggae picked my pocket and tough gong during the state what? of emergency in June of 76. We were taken to Jimmy's house and had a, a wonderful afternoon with, with those, you know, really critical people in reggae's history. I think about that story of you. I won't say it if you won't say it, but uh, of you telling me about which artist to oh, no. your pocket. And I, it always we, pops in my head when I see that artist. Uh, oh, no. So I'm like, well, I don't like you anymore. I'll tell you, when I, when I tell, when I tell ja Jamaicans that, 99% uh, of them say, oh, I bet I know who it was. It was blank, blank. And I go, oh, my yep. gosh. Oh my, that's uh, I definitely will hear that off camera for sure. Yeah, for sure. Um, so I wanted to, um, man, there's so much for, for people out there who have never seen your um, your live uh, life of Bob Marley presentation that you do. Um, can you maybe describe what that is? Because um, you are a performer yourself. You went on tour with the uh, with the Whalers recently, doing your 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 live opening act. For the survival. Yeah, the Survival Revival Tour in 2013. I was the opening act for two week, two months in the winter, sleeping on the floor of the bus. Wow. Um, I, I Back in 1984, a man with the wonderful name of Bob Wisdom was asked to put together the National Video Festival at the American Film Institute in Hollywood. And... Uh, he asked me if I would come and show some of my boot, uh, my uh, unofficial <laughs> video collection. And um, it was on a double bill the night that Stop Making Sense was premiered by Jonathan Demi, who became a good friend over the years when he was making his Marley doc. And um, I brought uh, about an hour's worth of unreleased footage of Bob. And I told his life story in between the clips. And it ended up getting really nice reviews in The Hollywood Reporter and Daily Variety. And then I started getting requests from um, colleges asking if I would come and do the same show. I said, oh, I, I guess I have a show. <laughs> so I started doing that. And then nightclub people started asking me to do it, too. And the, the most interesting one was Larry Gold, who runs SOBs in New York, Sounds of Brazil, the World Beat Club down in the village. And he hired me um, in 1988 to go to the, uh, the Ritz and be the opening act for Burning Spear. And I said, well, I don't know how this is going to work in a nightclub, but it was a, a huge screen and there were 1,800 people there. And I told Bob Marley's life story and showed on release clips. And I got a standing ovation at the end of the evening. And wow. Larry said, listen, if you can come with new material every year on Bob Marley's birthday, I will hire you every year. So for 16 years, on February 6th, my California soul found its way in bitter cold New York and uh, wow. d doing shows with Bob's mother, with the Whalers Band, with Sugar Minot, with... All, all kinds of interesting people and uh, those those were fascinating evenings because i i was looking every year for new material to to turn people on to and uh, for a long time it kept coming now all that stuff's on the internet and i i feel guilty about doing the show well but i don't I think, think my you... whole purpose uh -uh. of doing it was to tell island records and the marley people look this is stuff people want to see for god's sake put it out right right, right. Oh, I, I guess, you know, I, I worked myself out of a job. <laughs> I mean, I don't think I, I would still love that footage might now be available on the Internet. But to hear somebody present somebody like you present it in the way that it should be presented and tell the correct stories. I mean, that's that's a that's a priceless experience. I, I only well, saw it, I, I saw it once. I remember um, 
I came with you to USC and and I I manned your merch booth that day and watched you. Uh, is it USC or UCLA? One of the two. And I watched you give your, uh, your oh, UCLA. Thing. Okay, yeah, that's UCLA. right. Yeah. And you had told me I, I don't know if I had this correct. I in my head you told me that you had never shown the same footage twice. Is that correct? And, and when I returned to a venue, yeah, I tried ah, to bring that was never shown at the venue prior to that. Right. No, you know, I think I think it was USC. I don't think it was UCLA. Okay. Because I I done several shows at at uh, USC. Mm -hmm. I I just did a class I think at UCLA. I didn't. In those days, I didn't have any merch. <laughs> mm. <laughs> you were selling the reggae scrapbook. I think that's what it was. Oh, it's got to be definitely USC. Yeah. I think that's what it was. We have, let's see, um, there are people leaving some comments. And Alex Peacemaker. Um, oh, yeah. My old friend Alex. All right. He hey, says, when. You ever, at all, you ever want to know anything at all about Yabby U? Uh -huh. This is the keeper of his uh, his treasures. Well, that's what, he's bringing, that's what he's bringing up. He says, when do we get the oral history of Yabby U? And he says, please talk about Toots. Yes. Oh, yeah. Well, I do want to talk to you about Toots um, because uh, Mike Parker from NiceUp.com down in San mm -hmm, Diego, mm -hmm. um, he called me for a quote about Toots when Toots passed. And we, as we were talking, you know, I said, you know, he really belie belongs in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And Mike said, yeah, absolutely. Why isn't he there? And I said, well, you know, I've, I've done a lot of shows there and I know people there and why don't we can, can can we use your website to start a petition to get him in there? And he says, well, how many names should we get? And I said, well, you know, I think 5000 is a fair round number. We should be able to do that pretty easily. So he put something up on the site and the word spread. And now Reg our friend Julian Schmidt at Reggaeville in Europe has put it up on his site. And I think there's stuff on Facebook and. Russell we we Gerlach, posted it at, uh, at, at uh, Rootfire, too, at rootfire.net. We, we circulated the petition as well. Yeah. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah. Well, we're almost 4,000 names. I, the reason I want to get 5,000 by Christmas is that in January, they have their annual meeting to uh, put the nominees for the Hall of Fame up for consideration. So it's really important that mm -hmm. we can get to 5,000 names before Christmas. Um, all you have to do is go to nice up dot com n i c e u p dot com and click on the picture of toots sign the post sign the petition and if you want leave leave a message there are people from all over the world who've left almost two thousand messages which are really fun to scroll through mm -hmm. some famous ones in there too um so i i really think toots deserves it toots and i had a wonderful relationship starting in 1980 in the early days of the reggae beat uh hank and i went to his hotel and did a long interview with him. And at the end of it, he says, now don't publish any of this stuff. <laughs> oh, you like, dude. <laughs> oh, yeah. Did you, did you talk him into it or he, did he no, held firm no, on that? He how he differentiated between dreads and Rastaman. Mm -hmm. You know, one cuts his hair, one doesn't, and one shaves and one doesn't. And, um, it, it was just a really deep, very personal thing because Hank did it with me and Hank, all Hank wanted to talk about was Rastafari, nothing mm -hmm. else. And, um, it, I have it, history will have it, you know, some PhD student will unearth it 20 years from now and end up writing a paper on it. Wow. Um, but the, the best interview I ever did with it was in 19, no, I'm sorry, in 2007, when I was doing my annual uh, Bob Marley show at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. It was in February of that year. And the next night, they had a, a, an, a living legend interview scheduled with Toots. And I said, well, why don't I do it? I mean, I really know his work. I've got all his records, the rarest stuff. And um, I'd be perfect for that. So he said, you wouldn't mind staying around an extra day? I said, hell no, let's do it. <laughs> so yeah. I brought out, I brought out this huge stack. I, I, I think it was something like 75 records. And I, they had a turntable set up on stage for us. And it was a sold out house. It was really packed. And every time I tried to play one of his records, he says, don't play that. Oh, no. Don't play that, Toots? Oh, no. Why? I hate that song. You hate Bam Bam? 
What? <laughs> me what? never get paid. Me never oh. get paid. Wow. I tried to play 5446. He says, don't play that one. I really hate that one. I said, hey, wait a minute, Toots. I've what? seen you go on for 25 years, and every single show you sing that song. I know, but I hate it. Why, Toots? I never get paid. <laughs> wow, man. Such a shame, right? To and have it to, to, geez. And then I said, so 5446 was your number when you were, he says, no, man. No, man. Wasn't my number. <laughs> Me just make it up. Me never have no number. Perfect. <laughs> the audience gasped, you know. So yeah. about five months later, Toots was playing at the House of Blues in Hollywood. And his manager, Mike Keisha, said to me, because I was emceeing, when you bring Toots on stage tonight, make, make sure you tell people about that honor paid to him at the Rock and Roll Hall. So I came out, and he had the original band with him from 1963, Jackie Jackson, all those guys, all what? these old guys, standing behind me on stage, these living legends like Tootsies. And so I said to the audience, by the way, at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, Toots admitted to the audience that night that 5446 wasn't his number. He just made it up. And the band goes, whoa, blood clock. You never know that. Sure. <laughs> Man, <laughs> dang! Shattering dreams over there, jeez. That is so Jamaican, isn't that Jamaican? Right. Yes. <laughs> it's like wow. those. Be it's like Beatles stories, though, right? People really want to hear a certain thing, and then you get the artist that just kind of you know breaks their heart a little <laughs> yeah. and goes, "No, why we never have even... no." <laughs> yeah, he's like, wow. "Nah, man." He's had three different titles for that song too. Mm -hmm. Really? Fifty-four. Oh yes. Yeah. Wow. And, uh, uh, 5446, that's my number. 5446 uh -huh. was mm -hmm. my number. 5446 mm -hmm. is my number. <laughs> Past, and, present, yeah. future. In that and, uh, and it, right. Yeah. And it really should be 5446 was never my number. Was never my number in the first place. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. That should put, be it, it. Put, it, put it on the 45. 5446 ain't my number. Man. But, you know, I'm getting back to... Um, our friend up in, in Canada, Alex Peacemaker, mm -hmm. uh, he, he was a very close friend of, of Yabby U's, and Yabby U trusted him with his master takes. He's sitting on some unreleased albums, and I, I think wow. they're in process now. Um, I better not say the label in case it doesn't work, but uh, in bringing out uh, more of Yabby U's very important work. And, of course, he was a Jesus dread. He didn't accept Selassie right. as God. And um, he used to get into long discussions, uh, according to Alex, with Bob Marley about that. They had sometimes heated discussions. So it's uh, it's part of the mythology of the music, and it deserves to be preserved. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Definitely. It might be, maybe I'll say the labels. It's, I think maybe Pressure Sounds has is, is been putting out a lot of like new or unreleased Yabby U. So maybe, maybe Alex has something to do with that. They've been putting out some good stuff. Um, yeah. Yeah, you you know, like you mentioned Toots saying, no, I don't like that. I didn't get paid. No, I don't like that. I didn't get paid. I mean, Leonard Dillon of the Ethiopians was, he he didn't go as far as not wanting to listen to the songs or perform them. But he told me that um, if it wasn't for the fact that people loved his Studio One songs so mm -hmm. much that he wouldn't play them either. He he knows he has to play them and he, you know, he wants to play them for the people. But he really just was was bitter about the way that that whole thing went down and he you know i think it was at your house in fact um where ben, ben and i were there getting our record signed and um ben gave him a copy of the song pirate and it was a reissue um and it was on the techniques label and leonard looked at it and he said wait a minute he's like winston riley who's the owner of the techniques label right he's like you yeah. never put this one out this is he's like can i and he asked ben can i take this back to jamaica because he wanted to go confront uh winston <laughs> Cause he was just, he had pirated the pirate song. And then we flash forward a year. We, we, we backed, we backed Leonard again. And Ben asked him like, Oh, Hey, do you remember, you know, whatever happened with the record? And Leonard was like, Oh yes, that was you. He was like, thank you. I went to Winston's house and I banged on his door and I confronted it Jeez. with him and he paid him some big sum of money, like on the spot. He was like, he's like, Winston got really afraid and gave him a bunch of money. So he was like, thank you. Thank you. And Ben wow. was like, yo, you're welcome. Um, do you did you bring the record back? Because <laughs> he just wanted to Ben just wanted to sign record back, and <laughs> Leonard didn't bring the record. But <laughs> yeah, like did just it would just you hear it just over and over and over about he, how he, just 
Leonard put it on Discogs. Yeah, Leonard sold it. And that's the other thing. It's like, Roger, you were mentioning how much your, uh, you know, your book, like copies of the book are going for. And you go on some of these sites and see, you know, rare reggae seven inches going for four or $500. And that's always my first thought is just this is like exponentially more money than that artist like ever sometimes made in their whole career. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. It's, it's ridiculous. ridiculous. Yeah, it's ridiculous. Um, so I I got to ask you this since you're on the, the podcast. Um, what do you have a favorite Bob Marley song? Yeah, Waiting in Vain. That's mm. it. It's how, I met, it's how I met Bob. Wow. Wow. Can you tell that this story? Is where you, this is where you say, yes. Will you tell that story? <laughs> <laughs> yes. We're, we're like, no, nah, just move on. Okay, cool. So um, what's your favorite cereal? <laughs> so. Um, in 1978, I was hired by a couple of Hollywood screenwriters to novelize their screenplays. And we moved to a, an A-frame on a mountaintop in Big Sur, and Mary and I. And it was just one of the most enchanting summers of our lives, our last without children. And um, we heard that Bob was coming to Santa Cruz. And we got tickets for both shows in the Santa Cruz Civic. Have you ever been in there? No. The Santa Cruz Civic? Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's like a high school gym. It has uh, uh, bleachers on three of the four walls. The stage is about three feet high. And there was a soundboard right in the middle of the dance floor. And as we were waiting to come in, uh, somebody was passing out flyers, well, posters, beautiful posters for a show three nights later at the Greek Theater in Berkeley. And I got one of those posters and I will, we were among the first people in, into the auditorium and we went up to the soundboard and there was a tall, slim guy with little tiny nubber dreads just starting to grow, standing by the board. So I figured he had something to do with the band. And I said, pardon me, sir, uh, are you going to do Waiting in Vain tonight? And he says, why? And I said, well, that's my favorite Bob Marley song, especially that incredible lead guitar line that Junior Marvin plays. And he said, you want to meet Bob? Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Can I bring my wife? He said, sure. So wow. he takes Mary and me down this long, long corridor to get backstage. And he says, what's your name? And I said, I'm Roger, my wife, Mary. He says, hi, I'm Junior Marvin. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. So the right thing to the right guy at the right time. So we oh, you stroked, you stroked his ego right there. It's beautiful. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but I was, it was the truth. It right. was the truth. You didn't know it was him. Yeah, that's it was. Beautiful. It was. Yes, yeah, from yeah, for sure. So we go in the back room, and they had these four huge cafeteria tables uh, made into a, a, an even bigger table, all pushed together, and everybody was arm's length from everybody else, and nobody was saying anything to anybody. So Junior said, "Why don't you ask Bob to sign your poster?" And I go, "Oh, yeah, <laughs> sure." So I mean, I was. Speechless. I was just dumbstruck. So right. we go around the table, and Bob is slouched in his chair, and he's red eye. And uh, I said, "Bob, are you going to do Waiting in Vain tonight?" And he looks up at me, and he goes, yeah, "Maybe." <laughs> <laughs> so I knew I was not going to get into a rap with Bob, but uh -huh. he did sign the poster. And then Junior took me around and introduced me to the entire band, and everybody signed the poster. And over the next fourteen years. Um, I got the I3 and his kids and his managers, his damagers, and, you know, 41 people who knew Bob really well or were related to him or worked for him. Chris Blackwell, Danny Sims, all those people. Mm -hmm. And when the um, Grammy Museum did its exhibition for Bob a few years ago, they borrowed my poster and they insured it for $75,000. Wow. I believe it. Wow. Yeah. It's priceless, really. Think yeah, about it. It is priceless. <laughs> it is. I, dead. Right, right. Wow. It's, yeah, Everybody it's got to be. Everybody I asked to sign it except Peter. Oh. Minas sign no blood clot Bob Marley poster. Oh, no. Wow. That is such a trip to hear. <laughs> to hear that yeah. dynamic for sure, yeah. Yeah. And, I and, and how. I so be on one. How was that? I mean, you know, everyone's doing their solo stuff, right? It's like, just like the Beatles. Everybody asked John and Paul, like, when's the last time you saw each other? Will you ever get back together? This, this, and that. Like, you know, 
in each of their passings, like, w w were they on good terms? Were they on? How, how was that? Peter did not speak to Bob Marley in the last two years of Bob's life. When he was in Germany, he never even picked up the phone to call Bob and see how he was in the cancer clinic. Bunny wow. was close to Bob to the end. But Bunny had problems with Peter in 76 when Bunny was going abroad to, or 86, when Bunny decided to start touring again. And he wanted Peter to come and open for him at Madison Square Garden. And Peter says, you open for me. I've been exactly. traveling the world for years, you know. <laughs> um, but, you know, Peter was bitter about Bob's success. There's a mm -hmm. lot of stories out there that I don't need to repeat where he... Right, right. He was, he was not very charitable toward Bob. Mm -hmm. It's a shame. There right. There was... But they um, were also, Bob and Peter were also talking about and Bunny uh, getting together again. And they did that reunion album in 1984 with, with uh, Junior Braithwaite from the original uh -huh. lineup uh -huh. and with uh, Vision Walker, who uh, replaced Bob in 66 when he was on uh, in exile in, in America. Um, that would have been an interesting project. Maybe Bob would have joined in on that. Yeah, I asked him about it after Peter told me uh, that they were talking about reuniting. He says, well, we're on different roads. One, one mangrove mango, one grand mangrove pear. Isn't that a trip? Because I think that, you know, you're only human. And so you kind of in the back of your head might think, you know what, there's a time for that. It's not right now. But you know, you don't think that, you know, we could leave this earth at any moment. You know, let me yeah. reconcile now or whatnot. So I, well, except I for Bob, except for Bob, who knew he was going to die at 36. Remember? Really? Wow. Well, if you had read my book, Roger, oh, see, there you go. <laughs> Devin's getting jacked. It, I'm going to jack him for the book. When Bob went to his mother's house for about six months in Wilmington, Delaware, actually mm -hmm. it's closer to nine, um, he was sweeping floors in the DuPont Hotel, but he was writing songs, and, and he had a couple of young friends, Ibis Pitts and Dion Wilson. And Ibis had a little kind of African arts and craft store across the street from uh, Bob's mother's house. They became friends, and one day Ibis and Bob and, and uh, Dion were talking, and they said to Bob, you know, you're, you're going to be a big star. You're going to have a, a lot of success, and big family, and uh, you, you know, nice long life, and you're probably going to help a lot of people. And Bob said, no. No, he says, when I'm 36, I'm going to die. Jeez. And they were, so, they were so struck by the specificity of what this young 24-year-old man was saying that they went to his mother that night and told her what Bob had said. And she confirmed that to me. And I've spoken personally to Dion and Ibis, and both of them swear that's what Bob told them that night in 1966. So it explains how Bob conducted himself in those final years after he learned he had cancer in 1977. Because his mother said he slept two or three hours a night. Otherwise, he was working. And, and he was never left alone. And, um, you know, so... He knew his time was short and he had to make the most of it. And he did, didn't he? He, he did. Certainly he did. I think, he did. I think Bob Marley is the greatest songwriter of the 20th century. I can't I think of too. a better can't think of a better songwriter. And not just in Jamaican music. I mean, you know, I love Leonard Dillon's one of my favorite songwriters, Justin Hines, you know, um, Joseph Hill, but but Bob Marley just there's something there's no such there's no ba there's no bad Bob Marley song there's not a single bad Bob Marley well song. he did he did make milkshake and potato chips <laughs> okay well <laughs> was leaving it out milkshake milkshake and potato chips. what label is that on <laughs> I need it now yeah what label I give you one guess yeah <laughs> oh, oh there you go there you go yeah. <laughs> you know, it, it's so funny I think when I when I was young right I've been listening to Jamaican music for a long time and when I was young I felt so much like Oh well, Bob Marley is the poster for reggae, and and when I tell people I listen to reggae or Jamaican music, they go, oh, "Bob Marley." When you're young, when you're a young kid, I'm like, "Well, there's so many other artists that are that blow Bob Marley out of the water." Like, you know, obviously you're young, and I'm all into the, you know, naming them. Dad, there's Derek Morgan and Prince Buster, and this, this and that, out now. And as you mature and you listen to more Jamaican music and you listen to more Bob Marley and his whole, I have to agree with Devin and obviously agree with you, Roger, that yes, he he's. There's no fluke. I mean, he is special, and and there's could have been no better person than to represent Jamaican music than Bob Marley yeah. for sure. So.
Well, the famous line from uh, our friend Kat Coor in Third World, everywhere he goes in the world today, he's judged on a scale of one to Bob Marley. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> That's it's, true. Good. it's true. He, it's I true. mean, just his, his lyrics just always, the way he, I've never heard another songwriter who can say something so simply and yet poetic at the same time it's it's that's it it's the concision of a great poet you know i the one i'm i'm fond of quoting is is from uh the the catch a fire album uh, she had brown sugar all over her booga wooga wooga mm -hmm. yeah that's not what it means uh, in jamaica in the cane fields when they cut down the cane there is this dark brown root which is useless there's nothing they can do with it and the people who work in the fields wear these um, canvas shoes that they call boogas, booga wooga shoes. Mm. So if you see a girl in Kingston with brown sugar all over her booga wooga, that means she's a cane field worker in from the country. So mm. it also means that. Right. right, right. I definitely <laughs> tell you that's not what I thought yeah. it meant when I first. See, that's see for, for me. For me, the line I think of is from the song "She's Gone" from Kaya, and where he says, um, "Old Mockingbird, have you ever heard words that I never heard?" And like that's that's one of those lines that just he found a way to like he wants to say that you know he's what his his woman is has been sad and he he wants to know what what she was thinking. And, you know, just wonders about things that she might have thought that he was never privy to. And the way he as a songwriter thinks to express that is like through the point of view of this mockingbird that look was the only thing there that heard her say something that he wants to know about. And those kind of lines like are in like every every Bob Marley song has a line like that. And it's just it's amazing to me. He is. I mean, even even when he first started off, right, his early stuff. Uh, I mean, I. I Good God. Stuff. Just stuff is just machine to make money you know that mm -hmm. that's everything you need to know about capitalism pay people 19 cents an hour in indonesia to make nikes and right. uh, keep them illiterate so they don't know any better good god this illiteracy is just machine to make money there it is in a coupler yeah All right well, so when you mention your what are your favorite songs by bob you guys i i like i mentioned it and i know that it's back out do it twice that whole era is ah man it's just something special about it and i know it, it was it recorded at dynamic and it was on beverly's or the leslie Kong stuff but besides the music because the music is stellar it's just the attitude you know it's it's like the beatles every album you think of abbey road or your sergeant peppers and they're different chapters so yeah I don't, without going into it it definitely have to be a song by that era and i love back out and do it twice yeah yeah and that's their pep talk to themselves. Devin? Um, I it's so hard. Because, you know, from that era you mentioned Roger, I love caution. You know, that's such a good one. Wicked. Um I love I love I, I think I heard this from you, Roger, uh, the first time. It's gotta be uh, Trouble on the Road again from the Lee Perry years. Um, that's just such and just everything from the ambience of the recording, it's like a, it sounds oh, like Yeah. It's like scary. It's it's so good. Um, they there's a line in there that says that I I know their knees are trembling like their nerve is gone, and Ooh. but but when I it wasn't until like I I started understanding patois better that I that I heard that that's what they were saying for years when I heard that song I thought they were saying I know their knees are trembling like a dead nervous clown <laughs> like that's <laughs> all I would sing the song on guitar and, and sing that line. And just one day I heard it for the 200th time. And it was just like clear in my ears. I was like, oh, wait a minute. It's not a dead nervous clown. It's, but that that one, um, I love the rock steady version. This might be one of my favorite songs of all time. The rock steady version of I'm hurting inside where he says, you know, if you don't come, I'm going to go looking for happiness. That to me is a perfect yeah. song. That hook is one of the best hooks I've ever heard. Um, Gorgeous song. Yeah. But see, you know, how people mishear the songs. I used to have a part of my Life of Bob Marley show where I would talk about how kids heard the songs. You, your onion and your onion and your onion away. Um, pajamas. Yes. I want pajamas with you. Pajamas, pajamas. Um, what were some of them? De De are... Devin, oh, my Devin, our son, yes. uh, used to sing Set the Cactus Free. And, uh, From Exodus, nice. It, it makes me feel like a sweet steak dinner. 
<laughs> and somebody from Scandinavia visited the archives once and said, Bob wrote a Scandinavian song. I said, no, he didn't. I said, yes, he did. I said, which one? I'll never forget Norway, how they crucified Jesus. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> yep. <laughs> No, that's that's so the good. next book right there. There you go. That's the next book. I see. I see. Could totally see a children's book like that. Pajamas, yeah. one page. It's pajamas. <laughs> it's all. I see the art. It's, it's yeah. Do you have? Yeah. I mean, what do you in your collection? Do you have like tunes that are just like no one's heard? I mean, I, I'm sure you have variations of recordings and versions. I'm sure, but actual tunes that you're like, wow, this is not yeah. any comps. This is on. And yeah. No one brings it up. Yeah. I do, and I'm bound contractually not to talk about them. Oh, <laughs> my gosh. I, think Devin, I, think I didn't know there was such a thing. Well, yeah. guess what? When when, the, when everything clears up and we get to a better day, we're going to – me and Devin uh, are, are, are due another visit to the – I'm spelunking in the archives. Uh, yes. There's nothing better. There's nothing better. That one time I did go, I, I was just amazed, jaw to the floor. And – yeah, man. And I wasn't even the collector I am now. That was years ago when I went to your, your pad, Roger. And well, I, you wouldn't recognize the place anymore. It's okay. seven rooms. The whole downstairs, I took over the guest room last year. Um, oh, it's, it's I, filled to the brim, seven rooms, floor to ceiling. A question that I, I should have asked this even earlier. I need to ask this. Because you have such gold, your your property, your estate is just filled with gold. How does that work? I mean, I would be all nervous. And, and do you have like the best water system if a fire breaks out? Do you have the best? Like, how does that work? I mean, I'd be so. You know, you know, Ja. I love you know, that. Ja. I love it. I love it. Ja, ja, ensure it. I love it. There you go. I love it. Ja is my co-pilot. Yeah. Yeah. I but, yeah. Same, but, the, but at the same time, Roger's like, mm, no incense in the. Yeah, in the, in the room. Oh, no, <laughs> we no, keep no. the ladders out. <laughs> and it's temperature controlled, you know, because it's downstairs yeah. of the house. Uh, it doesn't get really hot in the summer. It's it's great. Right. You know, but it's just so filled with boxes on boxes. There's 1,500 T-shirts. There's, you know, statues and paintings and framed posters and right. uh, screen, uh, bamboo screens with Bob as a, right. as a Chinaman. Um, wow, and, uh, there's a lot of stuff you haven't seen yet. So when this COVID nonsense is over, you guys uh -huh. gotta come over. We'll do a remote definitely. show. Yes, yes. definitely. Yes. That's we're just waiting. We're just waiting until we can oh, do this. Yeah. I mean, it's we're we're blessed by like the you know if this COVID had happened even ten years ago, none of these like the technology wouldn't have allowed for so many things we're able to do now. So you know we do we are thankful for stuff like this. But man, it does not replace the in person. You know the in-person hang so we can't wait to yes, be able to interview right. people in person and, and definitely to come to your house i don't think people realize you know people who have heard, maybe who know who you are and know that you're a reggae collector but have never been to your place i i don't think they really realize what you have there because it's not just that you are a collector with many records and artifacts but the setup of it it's like I always call it reggae Disneyland and you know you literally like go through you know you think it's a wall but then it opens into a door and then you're in this weird like it's like the haunted mansion at um Disneyland like you're in this little area and then like each wall opens up and suddenly you think you've seen your collection you know you've seen all yeah. the stuff in the living room and everything and then you're like okay now let's actually see the collection and then this is this giant room of that just that's hidden you know full of it is Disneyland and, and halfway Amazing. Halfway through, there's a popcorn machine, a churro machine, and <laughs> yeah. cotton candy. It's a yeah. journey. It's it's a it's a great journey. <laughs> what would you say? Because uh, I know there's been some interviews on YouTube, Roger. But what would you recommend for someone who really hasn't that wants to kind of experience what you got going on? And like, is there is there any like you YouTube know, video? Uh, I did an interview about a year ago with Phil Kogan. Phil Kogan is just a charming guy. He was raised in the Caribbean and New Zealand, and he is the host producer of the Great Race. He's won 10 okay. Emmys and he has been to 130 countries around the world. And in every one of them, he said, he has found evidence of Bob Marley. So he wanted to do an interview with me for his uh, video blog on YouTube and uh, find out why. And I, ha I had a really great time with him. He asked all the right questions and uh, 
as I say, he's a charming guy. So if you go to YouTube, uh, you can put my name in there, uh, S-T-E-F-F-E-N-S, Roger Steffens. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the things that will come up in the list is called Bucket, B-U-C-K-E-T. And he interviews people for his bucket list. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. Click it. Click it before you kick it. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Uh, I, I am bucket number 21. Wow. Bucket 20. Good number to be. So it's easy to find, and that, that's a good one. There's also a talk I gave. You know what? I was asked when my Marley book came out to do a lecture at the Library of Congress. Wow. Jeez. Bob Marley in the Library of Congress. And that is on video so if you put my name in and put library of congress that video will come up and that's got a lot of excerpts from the book so much things to say so nice. those two are, are worth uh, looking at and then there's the most wacky interview i've ever done in my life with a fellow named jerry fialka f-i-a-l-k-a and his is about philosophy and you guys should watch it just for ideas of things that you can ask people in your interviews. Okay. Because these are questions that you've probably never thought of asking anybody ever in your whole life. But they force you to really get down to your basic moral philosophy and tell people who you are and what you would do. And so Jerry, with a J, Fialka, is also uh, in the uh, list if you, if you Google me. So wow. I, I think those three are good places to start, but there's scores of interviews with me all over right. the internet to help people who have to listen to all of that stuff. And, and and what do you have going on right now? What can we what can we tell the people that you're working on? Well, I'm working on two projects. One is uh, to get my archives to Jamaica to become the museum I've been hoping for all my life. And the other is the fourth book in a series of photographic books that I do with my daughter, Kate. Um, our Instagram is called The Family Acid. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's, that's the uh, second book we did, The Family Acid Jamaica. Oh, nice. With These are so amazing, Jamaica. man. These are great. Oh, I, thank I, you. Yeah, I love the pictures from The Family Acid, for sure. There's the, yeah. And Katie it, called it that because she said when she was a, a kid, her friends told her our family was like the Waltons on acid. <laughs> Wow. And we're doing a Vietnam book now because I spent the last 26 months of the 60s in the army in Vietnam, Tet right. Offensive and all that stuff. And I started a refugee campaign that raised over 100 tons of food and clothing. So the colonel said I could go anywhere from the DMZ to the Delta and work on any project I thought worthwhile as long as I took pictures. And that's where I learned to be a photographer. But this will be a little different book from any of the others. It'll be more like the reggae scrapbook because... Uh, it'll have uh, artifacts, pictures of Viet Cong propaganda and things that wow. we did in our psyops printing plant and um, letters home and excerpts from a memoir I wrote when I came back that never got published. Uh, so it'll be a, a different kind of Vietnam thing. Originally, it was going to be called Vietnam, the human side, because I never wow. fired a shot the whole time I was in Vietnam. Um, right. Got shot at, burned out, you know, that stuff, but never, never saw anybody to shoot at and right. um that, that should be out in about a year and a half the family acid vietnam nice and a lot of wow. stuff about the island of the coconut monk which to this day at the age of 78 and a half was the most incredible place i've ever seen in my life an island of six thousand dropouts from the war led by a four and a half foot tall hunchback monk who hadn't lain down in 30 years Praying what? to Christ, Buddha, Muhammad, Lao Tse, Confucius, Sun Yat Sen, Victor Hugo, and Winston Churchill. Wow. wow. And the only place I ever saw happy people. You know, they, they were in the middle of the Mekong with the North Bank controlled by the Americans and the South Bank by the communists. They fire rockets and mortars over the island, but never touch the island. And wow. uh, they prayed every three hours, day and night, for peace. And it was the most incredible place I've ever been in my life before or after so there'll wow. be a lot of the coconut punk in my vietnam book that's amazing i can't wait for that everyone should yeah. really go follow the family acid on instagram it's pretty much the best page on instagram the photos are amazing <laughs> right yeah the as roger said it's run by run by roger's daughter kate it's really it's really yeah. great it's so good um well man we have so i mean we could do this for hours and hours it's coming up to the two hour mark so what we like to do at the end 
um, is a little thing called the rapid fire question where we're just going to, we're just going to ask you just some, it's just some quick questions and you just kind of, some of them are either or, some of them are more open ended, but just kind of the first thing that comes to your to your head. Roger, right. uh, you want to start? You want to start? Yes. Favorite song on the Catch a Fire album? Concrete Jungle. Go ahead, Dev. Very good. You Roy or I Roy? You Roy. Sativa. He was the anything? inventor. I Roy called himself that in homage. Mm-hmm. Right. You right. Roy. And Sativa. You Roy just did that. Great album with the uh, tracks from Lee Perry. You know about that? That Dr. Dredd did the uh, "My Cup Runneth Over" album. I, I think I can. You tell us about that. I think I heard about that. That sounds familiar. He has wow. you, Roy. He comes. There he is. <laughs> yeah, just you, Roy comes in. Wow! Can you look see at that? that? There it is. Wow. Yeah. And here's this incredible picture. Really great picture of. Um, Lee Perry and Uroy and the Whalers sitting around a table wow. sharing a chat. Look at that. Are you si- wow, that It's looks all really the dope. original Lee Perry tracks from 1970 and 71 mm-hmm. with brand new Uroy raps over them. Dr. Dredd did it. It's called My Cup Runneth Over. It's a great album. Wow. wow. And I wrote, I, I wrote the liner for it. Of course. Of course you did. Of course. <laughs> of course. Of course. That's, that's amazing. Um, okay. Raj, go ahead. Sativa or Indica? Indica. Okay. Dev. That seems to be the consensus answer. answer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Speaking of herbs, speaking of herbs. Herb uh, I, I never smoked a cigarette before I went to Vietnam. And I had done acid two years before I went to Nam, and I'd never smoked a joint. I mean, if you've had an H-bomb, what do you need a firecracker for? <laughs> right. <laughs> but I got to Saigon. I got to Saigon, and I discovered Park Lanes. You can see the mm. Vietnamese tax stamp. And wow. these are pre-rolls of Kami weed. They were 25 cents a pack or $2 for a carton of 200 joints, penny a joint. That's how they won the war. And that's wow. where I first started smoking herb. Wow. wow. So you could just, story. wow. So you, I didn't, you could just buy weed in these cigarettes? Oh, anywhere. You ask your mm-hmm. petty cab driver, give you a pack you send somebody out for a carton and in the boonies the maids would smuggle it on base and they put it under your pillow in your in your bunk in the in the barracks wow, quarter geez. a pack that's how they won the war <laughs> it's so true peter tosh would have been like it takes more than this to get my propeller going <laughs> Take <the whole> carton. <laughs> yes okay uh let's see Oh, which one? Okay, Studio One or Treasure Isle? Studio One. Studio One rules. <laughs> yeah. Chris Blackwell or Chris Wilson? <laughs> oh, Chris Wilson. I mean, yeah. You, you, yeah, I never mind. Bite your tongue, Roger. Exactly. It was more for jokes. <laughs> I love Chris Wilson. Chris He's been a, a dear guy. friend. We did a lot of projects together over the years. I, right. Uh, Leroy uh, notated all the, the Whalers' Coxon catalog thanks to yeah. Chris. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Okay, well, this is more open ended, but I just wanted to—I didn't get to this question, so I'll sneak it in the rapid fire section. Favorite reggae harmony group? Uh. Oh God! Uh, well, leaving the Whalers out. We'll leave the Whalers out. Besides the Whalers. Yeah, besides the Whalers. Uniques. Ooh, mm. that's a good one. That's Cornell nice. Campbell and Slim Smith. How can you beat that? Can't. You really can't. Ever. That was a really great answer. I was thinking, like, is he going to say Mighty Diamonds? Is he going to say, like, Heptone? Uniques is great. Uniques is really, but really good. Think about it. Front. Uniques is like the band that the Mighty Diamonds and Heptones will say, oh, yeah, no, the Uniques. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, okay. And Winston Jarrett and the Flames. Winston Jarrett is one of my all-time great Ooh. love singers. I, I just think he is so underrated. He is. He's still alive. He's in his nineties. We backed him up, right, Devin? Roger, Roger, and I. Yeah, Roger and I drove to Seattle with the Expanders and played. They wanted us to come play a show um, before Expanders really had a lot of records out, and and they were like, "Come play at this venue up there called the Nectar Lounge, which is a great venue." Mm -hmm. And they said, um, and we were like, "Why do you want us to play?" And he's like, "Well, he's like, I kind of you know play the show, but only if you." 
will back up Winston Jarrett as the opening act. <laughs> so we were just only like, if you, yeah, yeah. all right. Well, do we have to? <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. We didn't do a we rehearsal. We had we just just learned his we learned the, the tunes he gave us, and we met him like 15 minutes before the show started, and we and we played the show. We got it. We have so a cool picture fun. with him from that, that show. So much yeah, the tape. Do you have a tape of the show? Mm. Man, Don't think this was right. This was like, what year was this? This was right in between. Like you couldn't. There was no like cassette player to put stuff in anymore because tapes weren't happening. But like it was right before I bought my little digital field recorder that I was bringing with me everywhere. So I don't know. I, it, that doesn't mean that one doesn't exist. I I bet I bet you with some work I could track one down. Might be some YouTube stuff too. You know, there's probably know. some YouTube stuff. Yeah. Did um, you ever see the documentary about him? No, no, I didn't know there was one. Yeah, I narrated it. It's on YouTube. Wow. Oh, nice. That's a okay. That's going on my watch later list. I'm watch that right. tonight. I'm gonna go down the YouTube rabbit hole after this, and it's gonna be it's gonna be <laughs> over with. Um, you get so many gifts. I'm sure because people know who Guests. you are and. and Gifts, gifts, gifts like gifts. Oh, yeah. You're oh, gifted yeah. so many different things, I'm sure, that it's surrounded about you know around Bob Marley and the Whalers. So, what is the one like you, most unique or weirdest thing that you got you've gotten gifted over the years? Well, that's a good question because I've got so many wonderful things to, thanks to other people. You know, that's why mm -hmm, I wanted mm -hmm. to be the museum because it's people's favorite things all in one place would be wonderful to have. Oh, gosh. Hey, I got that same sort of uh, chair. <laughs> um, you know, Charlie Comer, I told you about Charlie. Charlie Comer was Bob and Peter's publicist, the old Irishman who asked me to yep. bring the, the herb to Peter. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Charlie was my Dutch uncle. You know, I, I had written, I think, two pieces in reggae news, and he treated me like I was... Bob Woodward or somebody. And he, he got me into have a private conversation with Peter and I was able to bring Peter over to Hank's house. And um, I just, I loved Charlie, you know? And when he died, he left me his diamond record of legend. That, that stands for 10 million sales made out to Charlie. Now, gold records are only important if they were given to the artist himself or someone very close to the artist who had played some role in the success of that project. You, you guys know that. So this is inscribed to Charlie, and it was his inheritance to me. He spent the last week of his life here with me when he was dying. And I, I treasure that as much as, as anything anybody's given me. Yeah. Wow. wow. Yeah, that sounds that's that's up there. Yeah. That's that's number one right there. Yeah, Devin, I'm all out of the rapid fire questions. What that's it. That's it. Um, I, you kind of I was gonna ask Bob Marley. I was gonna say Bob Marley, the Lee Perry years or the Island Record years, but I feel like we already kind of touched on that. But if you had to pick between the two, I think for the Whalers as a trio, the, uh, the most important sessions were the Lee Perry ones. They're they're the ones with the most lasting effect. Uh -huh. Um they were closer to what modern roots was as opposed to the mm -hmm. island period, the uh, coxswain period. Um, yeah, yeah, the Lee Perry period. But, you know, almost all of the island albums were produced by Bob, even though Blackwell put his name on him and took 2% for it. Um, he did play a role in producing and Americanizing the Catch a Fire album. But you know, from from Natty Dread forward, those were albums Bob made. Mm -hmm. Bob. Um, so you know, between Bob and Lee Perry's Bob, there's a lot mm -hmm. to like, and I don't think you, it's apples and oranges. You, you can't yeah, they it's apples and oranges. It's apples and oranges for sure. I just, to me, the Lee Perry years is just some of the best. I mean, if Bob Marley is my favorite songwriter and artist, and those are my favorite, you know. Bob Marley years, then that's got to yeah, be my favorite. It's, it's that's got to be my favorite music, you know. <laughs> it's the beginning of rockers. Rockers. Yeah, there you go. Rockers. Greetings and love. <laughs> yeah. Right. Doesn't he start uh, off like that? Greetings yeah. and love. 
the rock Love rockers. rockers. Do you know? If, did you ever meet that guy, Roger? The guy, the very the first scene of rock, of Rockers with the big like beaver. Did I ever meet? Oh, oh not Ro- you. you Roger. Mean, yeah. Dang, I was like, what? No, Roger. Did you ever meet him? Yeah. The guy, the first scene of Rockers. No, it was one of Ross Michaels' friends out in the bush. Okay. I love just... Rockers. But we drove all the way to San Francisco to see the premiere. Wow. Wow. It's got to be the best it's reggae movie, movie, right? At the Castro Theater. <laughs> uh-huh, uh-huh. Wouldn't you say that's the best reggae movie? I would call Rockers the best reggae movie. Hard to beat. Well, harder, harder they the, come in Rockers from me. You yeah. got Rockers, and you, you have to think about the, the greatest. Uh, rock, I, I mean, reggae documentary ever made by my dear recently deceased friend Jeremy Marr, Roots Rock Reggae. Roots Rock Reggae. Yeah, they, Roots keep, Rock they keep pulling scenes out of that for documentaries for decades after. You know, the yep. classic thing with the gladiators and Lee Perry yep. and this go together. Mm-hmm. Ross yeah. Michael and Barefoot out in the, in, in the boonies and the stream and Joe Higgs singing There's a Reward on his porch. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's just such a god. You, you, Roy. You know everybody who counted uh, Jacob Miller. They're all in that film. Yeah, yeah. And that's, Heartland that's Reggae still, too, right? That was one. Heartland Reggae. I, I, I'm a. Oh, if you want? Can I spill some secrets as long as yes, we're please. getting? Please. Do it. I was afraid to tell people for years. But I, I do three voices in that film because uh, Randy Torno and Jim Lewis were here in L.A. Uh, editing that film in the late 70s. And I set up evenings for them to see that film with Bob Marley when, when he was here on his last tour. On the Monday night, I set up a screening of Jeff Walker's Smile Jamaica footage and the next night, uh, a work print of, the, of Heartland Reggae. Got to watch Bob watch Bob. And uh, that that was a very, a very important film. Um, I started to think of something else, and I got sidetracked there. You were going to spill some secrets. That's some mm-hmm. voice. Oh, yeah. Okay. Give us the okay. good. So, Heartland Reggae, they asked me to dub um, some of Peter Tosh's speech at the One Love Peace concert oh. because they thought the patois was too thick and people wouldn't be able to penetrate it. So, I... I said I would do that, but you can't say it's Peter's voice. You can say those were the words of Peter Tosh, right? So when I get the final film from them, you hear me do Peter's quote, and then the uh, narrator comes on and says, that was Peter Tosh. (laughs) No, it wasn't. That was Roger freaking Stephan. And I'm also the voice of Marcus Garvey. Right. And uh, I highly Selassie. Wow. So I was always <laughs> afraid, you know, some Rasta would come and beat me with a bamboo pole if, if they heard that I was doing His Majesty's voice. But, you know, no, so far, so no good. harm. After and, this show, though. Yeah. <laughs> you still the secret now. <laughs> I hope that's on your resume, too, like on your long list no, of no. things. No, I never told anybody. <laughs> You're like, no, no. <laughs> The voice of Marcus Garvey, ladies and gentlemen. We should have introduced you like that. That would have been great. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, the voice of Marcus Garvey. <laughs> Welcome to the show. Well, Roger, I'm I mean, it's... The... Go ahead. No, please finish say, that. Have you ever seen Forrest Gump? I tell people this all the time. I love that please, movie. Please, go ahead. I'm, I'm, yeah. the, I'm the announcer in the White House when he goes to visit Kennedy and he has to... I did not up. know that. And I did the, not know that. Wow. Well. I'm also the announcer at the bicentennial celebrations, and his old lady gets up and turns me off. <laughs> you know, so I, I've been, you know, coming to your house since since I was in, you know, tenth grade or something, and and, it, and I remember sitting in high school science class. I don't know what like what year it was. I remember sitting in science class, and we were watching some documentary, and I'm just kind of half paying attention, and all of a sudden I'm like. I know that voice, and you were totally one of the voices in some kind of so whatever we were watching in science class that day. You oh, were, no. you were the, it was absolutely your voice. I was like, that is Roger. <laughs> wow! Uh, there was when a, the a proton company. and the neutron. <laughs> yeah, Cy, Cy Wexler science films. They were shown in schools all over the country, and I was his uh, primary voice for about fifteen years. There you go. I didn't even know that. There, that was wow. I got it right. Yeah, that was a trip. That was just like, just pulled me out of my, I was like, Roger, this is weird. It's crazy. You, you know what's funny? 
Uh, I did a movie called Can't Hardly Wait. About oh, the I, last day I know that movie, movie, yeah. Know that movie? You know yeah. who I am? I am the love jock. Oh snap! Everything's coming. <laughs> everything's making sense now. Oh, well, now I gotta watch that movie again. <laughs> wow! I remember <laughs> playing an early show at the uh, University of Indiana in Bloomington, and um, I got to know the MC of, of the evening before they brought me on. And I, uh, I told her that you know I was a voiceover actor in, in Hollywood, and um, she had a little prepared thing you know this this man has uh, narrated an oscar winning documentary and he's done a syndicated show heard on 130 stations around the world and i said yeah did you ever see uh, uh, that that movie and uh, she mm -hmm. said yeah and i said well i'm the love jock and she almost <laughs> dropped her papers and she came out on stage and she said you know, this guy you're about to hear, I mean, he did an Oscar-winning film and a lot of other stuff, but that doesn't matter. He's the love jock in Can't Hardly Wait. They were screaming at me. Right. I mean, this and, was a long time ago when the film had just come out, but evidently mm -hmm. all these kids had seen it. The love right. The next time we have you on the show, the intro is going to be lecturer, author, the voice of Marcus Garvey, Haile Selassie, the love jock himself, the love jock himself. Roger Sevens. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, yes. that's so good. Jeez. Well, Raj, we really got to have you on again. We could just we could do this for hours. Thank you so much for coming yes. on. It was great. Um, it was just great to see you. I miss you. <laughs> you know, yeah. I hope we can hope we can occupy the same physical space. Uh, you know, before too long. Yes. Get together fleshically again and relive some old yes. times. It was great watching you grow, Devin. Let me tell you that. You know, <laughs> seeing you in your early stages of obsession and what you made of it and the incredible <laughs> success that you've had with the expanders one of my favorite recent moments in reggae history was when your album supplanted damian marley as the number one album in billboard's american reggae chart congratulations <laughs> once more on that that was a, a hell of an album too and raj i look yeah, forward man. to welcoming you back too i remember you when oh, you man. had hair <laughs> yes, there was a little bit of hair going on there, and it was a great. That was a long, long time ago, man. Yeah, we we're, we're due for another visit well, for sure. The balance in nature, see? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I gave you some of that right there. I That's like so the good. look; it looks <laughs> <Yeah>. great. <laughs> that backlight is pretty trippy, isn't it? I yeah. love it. It's, yeah, it's, it's very it's good. Metaphoric. <laughs> man, thank yeah. you so much, Raj. Please, please uh, give our best to Mary again. It was good to see her for yes. a second in the in the sound check and. Um, yes and the whole family and uh, everybody, you know, look out for the, go pick up the, the family acid books that are available and look out for the family acid Vietnam book coming out pretty soon. Right. And go to niceup.com and sign the petition to get rock and roll hall of fame membership for Toots Hibbert. Yes. Nice up. Yes. Um, take you 30 seconds of your life and please spread the word to everybody else. Hey, this was really fun for me. It's so so wonderful to talk to people who know what they're talking about. You know? <laughs> well, thank, thank you, Roger. That's the biggest compliment you can give us. <laughs> right. Thank you so much. Man. One love, my brother. <laughs> All right, Raj. We'll see you, Roger. You soon. Until next. Yay. Man, that, that was so much fun. So much fun. Wow. I love, I mean, I just feel like I feel just really lucky doing these. Like if, if COVID has a silver lining for me uh, personally, it's been the reggae pod clash. Cause right. I just can't believe the people we've been able to talk to. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, right there, Roger was talking about bucket lists. I mean, that was a bucket list for me because, you know, I've known Roger for about 20 years, but I've always wanted to interview him. Mm -hmm. you know? And just, that was, well, that's, that's like, I, I don't know, man. That's like cooking for, for Ramsey or something, chef Ramsey, or, you know <laughs> what I mean? That's like cooking. It's like you're interviewing the master, you know. The well, master. it's just because he's got such great. He just knows everything, and he's got such great he does, stories. For sure. And anything you bring up, he can relate to something else that's more interesting than the right. subject you raised, you know. And it's just, it's. I mean, it was so I rewarding just to, like I said, we're big fans of reggae music. So to, it's like you know, if this was going live or not, this is the kind of hang that we would just get so stoked on. Um, if anyone ever yeah. has a chance to go to Roger Stephens' house, um, don't pass. Yeah, don't pass. That I'm out. telling you, the vibe, yeah. the vibe at Roger's house, just between him and his wife Mary, who are just the best people, and then the collection that he has. And like I said, it's not just a collection; it's the way it's presented and organized. 
Right. Um, it's Roger, just, Roger no, really cares. He nurtures that the whole whole collection, you know? Yeah, there's no place like it because, you know, now, especially in this day, day and age of like being able to order records and there are people in the world who have maybe bigger record collections, although it'd be hard pressed. He's got a huge record collection, but maybe, you know, have like, you know, you could find a collector who's got like some, you know, 1969 early reggae singles that Roger maybe doesn't have on LP or, or you know, seven inch or whatever, but but just there's no collection in the world like the reggae archives at, at his house because it's just it's it's a, it's a museum it's a museum in his house he presents it as such he's got everything signed um you know he he downplays it but you know he's got he's got the first record that Bob Marley was given the day he recorded the record his first record and brought it home and gave it to his mom and you know because Roger has cultivated these relationships with people and because they trust him. And he was one of the first journalists to write about reggae and take it seriously and not treat it as some novelty music because mm -hmm. of that, because of the kind of guy he is, people would just give him things, you know? So Bob Marley's mom, cause like, you know, I would tell people in high school, oh, I went to Roger Steffen's house and he's got Bob Marley's first record. And they're like, no, he doesn't. How would he get that? Well, he got that because Bob Marley's mom like was like, I don't know a better place to, store right. these you know like right. please take this stuff and so just got that it's got that kind of vibe at his house man it's just so great and they're such great people so right um, i miss it i miss going over there um yeah and hopefully someday soon we'll be able to do it and i'm just looking here for our next slide we, this is a long episode um is it which was very there? good but what do you got coming up Roger? man Funk? it's christmas time it's december and i know it may not feel like your average Christmas year, and it shouldn't, and that's cool. That's okay. But what you can do is jam out at home to some new music. I have a new 45 I just released. It's the Rocksteady rendition of the Peanuts, the Peanuts gang, you know, Charlie Brown, Snoopy, and the whole crew. Um, Christmas mm -hmm. time is here, and then Linus and Lucy on the flip. They're reggae and Rocksteady versions of the two classic tunes that you definitely have heard. Um, and so go to rogerrevis.com. Go check that out and get your get your copy. I'm sending copies. I've been sending copies out all week. And a lot of people um, uh, have been getting them day by day and posting and, and tagging. So it's a really cool, fun thing that I do. I try to do it every year is release a, a reggae 45, uh, you know, rock steady reggae kind of stuff. So, um, yeah, go to rogerrevis.com. Get your copy, man. I'll, I'll be uh, throwing it in the mailbox for you. And Devin, Beautiful. what do you got cracking? I've got the same things going on every Tuesday. Please join me at 5 p.m. Pacific time on rootfire.net slash TV or my Facebook or my Instagram for songbook sessions. I sit right in this chair and I play guitar and sing songs. I'll take your requests if you want to hear expander stuff, if you want to hear some of this new um, acoustic album stuff that I've been working on and that we're finishing this weekend. We just I just mastered it yesterday. Roger and I yes. are put the finishing touches on the art and it will be sent off to the vinyl plant next week. Um, but just come hang. It's really, really a fun Tuesday. This last Tuesday, I, I lost my voice, but I did it anyway and did like a, a Q and A, and I thought I would just go for fifteen minutes, and I ended up almost going the whole time. We had a cool hang. Wow! So it's really fun. Um, if you want to take a music lesson, go to backstagemusiclessons.com. dot com. Um, I really love giving beginning guitar lessons, songwriting lessons, vocal lessons. Let's do a lesson. I am going to enjoy it as much or as more as you as you will. So please uh, don't be shy. Let's do a lesson. And then go follow me on Twitch because Twitch. I want to do some DJ live streams. And Twitch is the place. Man like Devin. Um, and then next, the next episode. So a couple things. First of all, um, in two weeks from today, we've got the great Derek Morgan, ska pioneer, Jamaican music pioneer, joining us. We're really stoked about this. Um, you know, Roger and I and Reed from Root Fire have a weekly call where we talk about, you know, we have our list of like guests we want and we have, you know, all, uh, people are at different tiers on the list. And Derek Morgan has just been at the very top of the list uh, really since we started the show. And um, we, we're just really, really stoked to, to get the chance to talk to Derek Morgan in a couple of weeks. So make sure you tune into that. And then that will also be, that's December 19th, that will also be the last episode of the reggae pod clash of 2020 and the last episode on a saturday because in 2021 we are switching over to thursday nights um it thursday just nights indeed now that you know music is starting to maybe baby crank up a little bit again live music we wanted to get ahead of the curve it's going to be hard to get artists to come on on saturday nights you know once touring starts up again so 
for now we're switching to Thursdays. So we got one more Saturday, which is two weeks from tonight, December Mm -hmm. 19th. And after that, we'll be moving to Thursdays. Um, Yes. Which is going to be good. It's going to be good for all of us. And, you know, other than that, please, everybody, go uh, subscribe to the show in podcast form wherever you get your podcasts. Please uh, leave a five star review and leave a comment. It really helps us uh, move up the charts in terms of like when people search for reggae podcasts, all that really helps us come out. So if you want to know how to support the show, that's a great way to do it. Um, And uh, until until uh, two weeks from now, when we have Derek Morgan, Mm -hmm. this is man like Devin and reggae Raj saying later days, everyone. We should have like a thing that we say at the end, you know, like, uh, saying and we both say it you know that's our cue to say it at the same reggae time. later yeah <laughs> everybody say irie uh, re- reggae later on three one two three reggae, reggae later, later. <laughs>